The story of Man from Hell begins on a night filled with stars, where the silence of the night in a luxurious hotel is broken by a scream of a woman's voice, which makes a shirtless man wake up from his sleep. The man is the main character named Ye Feng, who was confused by what sound he heard just now. Ye Feng was also very surprised when he witnessed a beautiful girl who was next to him at that time, and apparently the voice came from the beautiful girl. The girl looked angry because she thought that Ye Feng had done something bad to her, even though Ye Feng himself had absolutely no memory of what had happened. Ye Feng's last memory is the moment when he was in the middle of the universe, where he, who is a demon god of hell, was carrying out a fierce battle against three overlords to fight for the throne of hell. His memory stopped there, and right now he was confused because he couldn't know anything for sure, but what was clear right now was that he was in the body of a weak human named Ye Feng. His head then ached, remembering all the events that had happened to Ye Feng so far. It seemed that Ye Feng had been oppressed by those above him, and even his existence as a member of the Ye family was completely ignored. At that moment, the memories of the demon god and Ye Feng seemed to merge, whereupon the demon god came to know of all the suffering Ye Feng had gone through. When he finally got the human's memories, suddenly a pillow flew right into his face, and it was from the previous girl who was angry because she thought that Ye Feng was the first person to have snatched her honor. Not long after they were arguing, suddenly a strange voice came from outside, where the sound also came from a gang of people who thought that Ye Feng had committed an evil act against Lin Lan, the most beautiful president of Jiangshu City. Their purpose in coming was to take pictures of the two of them so that it would create a huge scandal, and that evidence could be sent to Gong Yunfei, so that in the end it could result in the two victims dying at Gong Yunfei's hands. Lin Lan herself was Gong Yunfei's fiance and it would definitely cause Lin Lan to get into trouble if her current whereabouts were discovered. This situation made even the demon god really angry, and he felt that all of this was a trap by people who disliked the owner of this original body. Ye Feng was deliberately trapped here after they previously drank a specially made concoction, and the purpose of those who hated Ye Feng for doing this was to give Ye Feng a cruel punishment that could even be said to be crueler than death itself. Even so, the demon god that inhabits Ye Feng's body is trying to find out about the figure who is currently plotting everything. The demon god then found out who was the mastermind from the conversations the underlings had about to surround him, where all of this was planned by young master Ye Hu. Young master Ye Hu himself was extremely harsh towards Ye Feng. Even when Ye Feng was completely humiliated and looked down upon, he was completely unable to resist. After that, Ye Feng, without thinking twice, immediately rushed away from there with an aura of fire coming from his body, so that he escaped just like that and caused the wilting of the plants he crossed. The red mist was his form, so he had currently managed to reach a place far away near the mountains. Meanwhile, in a different place, Ye Hu's men managed to catch Lin, but there Lin was alone. There was no one in that place besides Lin. This made them not know what was happening. They also failed to get what they wanted, while Lin himself was confused by this incident. He didn't know where Ye Feng had gone, plus a plant had suddenly withered in its place. Back to Ye Feng where at this time he found Ye Hu's place, and Ye Feng was stalking him. Ye Hu was also very happy, because he felt that his plan to take down Ye Feng would be successful. But soon, Ye Hu got a call from his men, where his men said that all missions failed and Ye Feng's current whereabouts were not known for certain. When Ye Hu was angry and intended to find Ye Feng's whereabouts, suddenly Ye Feng appeared now very happy. There, Ye Feng immediately said that Ye Hu was a family traitor where they actually came from the same family lineage. But now Ye Hu actually wanted to make him perish. Ye Hu hated Ye Feng because he felt that Ye Feng was a useless trash who didn't deserve to inherit everything regarding the Ye family. Unmitigated, Ye Hu was really angry, and without thinking, he immediately drew a knife towards Ye Feng. But the attack was broken by Ye Feng very easily. Those attacks were certainly the easiest attacks a demon god figure had ever faced. Here Ye Hu didn't know if the demon god's existence had possessed Ye Feng's body. Ye Feng countered the attack by strangling Ye Hu's neck while telling Ye Hu that, Never interfere with his existence again, because if not, his life will end soon. Ye Feng didn't stop there. 
he immediately released his demonic aura so he could scare Yehu away. Yehu was really scared and tried to run away. He and his men immediately stepped on the gas of the car they used to avoid Ye Feng's attack. When he felt that the range was far enough, Yehu said that for the next meeting, he would never let go of Ye Feng. When he muttered like that, suddenly a sign appeared on the roof of his car. The mark came from the mark created by Ye Feng, and it could instantly make a huge explosion occur. By this time, Ye Feng had taken control of everything himself, and within seconds, he had directly destroyed the car. But fortunately, in the last seconds, Ye Hu managed to jump out so his body was not destroyed by the explosion, but he suffered a pretty bad injury from this situation. Ye Hu was sure that the current Ye Feng was no longer a human, but a demon. Ye Feng himself decided to let go of Ye Hu, and didn't want to finish him first because he still wanted to find out information. But if Ye Hu dared to bother him again, then he would never be safe. Then Ye Feng went to the river and he saw a lot of life aura radiating there. But when he stepped into that place, he had a flashback about his past when he was in the battle between the gods. In that place, someone seemed to have succeeded in protecting Ye Feng, and the person who helped Ye Feng, a.k.a. the demon god, was a woman with long white hair who really didn't want to leave Ye Feng just like that. The figure of the woman herself is called Huang, someone who always and always does anything for Ye Feng's needs. Huang even said that he didn't care what happened to this world. He would only follow Ye Feng wherever Ye Feng was, never caring whether he lived or died. Huang was the type of person who was really loyal at that time. Ye Feng had to lose a precious figure in his life now that he was reborn. Ye Feng also thought that Huang might also be reincarnated like him. And after that Ye Feng really starved, he would immediately increase his demonic abilities and absorb all the life aura that was around him. First of all, he will absorb living things in the river. Even though this body is very weak, Ye Feng motivates himself to become much more powerful and return to being a very feared demon king. The next day, to be precise, in a river, where in the river there were officials who were fishing. The grandson then asked his grandfather about whether this grandfather was really strong in the past. The assistant then explained to the granddaughter girl named Miss Bai, where according to the assistant, grandfather was a warrior in the past, and he was the king of swordsmen. Even if he is now old, he is still capable of dealing with ordinary special forces. Grandpa is a really deadly soldier, and Uncle Zhang, a.k.a. assistant, is the current king of special forces, so both of them can be said to be quite powerful and can handle 20 to 30 people at once. When they were talking, suddenly the fishing rod used by grandfather was grabbed by a fish. Uncle Zhang then ordered grandfather to stand behind him since he would be the one to deal with the chaos. The attacks started being carried out by grandfather's men. But one by one the attacks couldn't hit Ye Feng. Even the guards now had to be overwhelmed by Ye Feng. Uncle Zhang was to the point of being rendered helpless, and he did not expect that this Ye Feng would be able to stop the various bodyguards that were here without even moving from his spot. Suddenly there was a figure of a guard who tried to attack with his feet, but the attack was easily broken, unmitigated. The attacks launched by the guards were now gathered by Ye Feng together, but still none of them managed to injure or even miss Ye Feng's body. Even now the guards fell to their knees because they could not withstand the greatness of Ye Feng. When Ye Feng faced them, the guard earlier also released his fire skill and directly attacked Ye Feng, causing a huge explosion to occur in that place. But in the end, it was the guards and Uncle Zhang who had to suffer defeat. Even so, inside Ye Feng he was saying that these people were quite strong, and surely fighting people like this made him think that this was a very good start to exploring this world. When Ye Feng started to get serious, suddenly the grandfather was humble. He said that he was very sorry for this incident. He was trying to apologize and compensate Ye Feng for the attacks his guards had carried out. Grandpa did this all because Grandpa realized that Ye Feng was not an ordinary human figure. Moreover, Ye Feng was able to destroy Zhang's arm with just one punch. Grandfather thought that surely this would be a very rare opportunity for the Bai family to benefit greatly from Ye Feng's powerful presence, or else they basically wanted to get Ye Feng to cooperate with their family. Ye Feng also welcomed it very well when he said that he was from the Ye family. But when he was close to the old man, he felt a scent that emerged from the body of the old man, and that smell was the smell of death, 
or clearly this old man would die in a very short time. The near future, said Ye Feng. Even though this grandfather looked healthy and fine at first glance, Ye Feng could see that this grandfather was suffering from a serious illness. Hearing Ye Feng's words that this grandfather was dying made his subordinates and grandchildren feel worried. They also said that Ye Feng was too presumptuous and shouldn't say those things. Even so, Ye Feng now unceremoniously left there with an indifferent look as he gave a warning, believe it or not. It's up to you, I'm just giving you a good warning. The grandfather then said that previously when Ye Feng approached him, the grandfather felt like he was in close proximity to a ferocious ancient beast. Grandpa himself said to Zhang that Ye Feng's figure reminded him of the legend of Ace's army. That army came from the god of war Long Ya. It was a mythical figure that had been missing for many years. Back to Ye Feng who was currently walking in the direction of the crowd. There he realized that the previous owner of this body was not well received by others and was always considered the weakest as well. Sure enough. Not long after there was a man named Zhong Chiang who looked down on him in embarrassment. He was currently with Ye Feng's ex-girlfriend. Where in the past Ye Feng was really obsessed with his ex. So that he was heartbroken because she left him. Chiang completely underestimated him saying if Ye Feng is a trash figure that the Gong family has always been looking for, even the Ye family itself is also looking for the existence of Ye Feng to exterminate. He told Ye Feng to immediately pay the fine for what Ye Feng did at this time for daring to ignore it. The girl who was Ye Feng's ex then told Ye Feng to kneel down so Qian could pity him. This former is a figure that was in Ye Feng's past before. Ye Feng at that time was really infatuated with that woman's figure because of her charming face. But this time Ye Feng didn't care about that anymore. The commotion from them provoked the onlookers who were there. And they also thought that Ye Feng was a trash bastard who dared to talk too much. They were also supporting Chiang to quickly beat him up at this time. Ye Feng's attitude had changed drastically. He even dared to insult his ex and said that a naughty girl was suitable for Chiang who then got really angry and threw a punch at Ye Feng. Then when Chiang was about to beat him, suddenly the figure of goddess Bai Yi who was the granddaughter of the previous grandfather now said, if Ye Feng is her boyfriend and anyone who dares to disturb him will deal with the Bai family. Chiang really couldn't do much because Bai Yi was from the very respectable Bai family. The students there were also very surprised by this situation. How could the popular girl from Jiang City University date Ye Feng? Even so, Bai Yi still convinced everyone that Ye Feng was her true boyfriend at the moment. This situation also made Chiang immediately apologize to Bai Yi, but even so Ye Feng didn't want to be cared for like that. He immediately approached Chiang, saying that Chiang, don't ever bother him again if Chiang doesn't want to die. Not only that, Ye Feng also said that his ex used to have fun with him, so Chiang only got the rest. Chiang got even more emotional with this situation and punched Ye Feng while saying that one day, he would soon find the right time to exact his revenge. After that, Ye Feng and Bai Yi walked together. There, Bai Yi asked for gratitude from Ye Feng because Ye Feng had been helped by her. But Ye Feng, who didn't want to thank at all because Bai Yi didn't really help him, he said that he can solve the problem. It wasn't even long before Ye Feng suddenly disappeared. But even so, Bai Yi still will never give up. He will find out about who Ye Feng really is, and what secrets are kept by Ye Feng. Then Ye Feng entered the classroom, and he found people in this place gossiping about him. It was as if they kept insulting him because Ye Feng had always been seen as weak. In that place also there is Chiang, who is waiting for a revenge that he will soon do. Not long after that, a fat man was seen trying to tell Ye Feng that at this time, Ye Feng had to leave the room immediately, because there would be a looming danger. The danger itself came from the subordinates of the Gong family intending to hunt down Ye Feng and teach Ye Feng a lesson. The Gong family did this because they assumed that this Ye Feng was related to Lin. The fat man was really very panicked by Ye Feng's state, but Ye Feng was completely calm by telling the fat man that he would quickly solve such little people. The fat man kept giving warnings to Ye Feng so that Ye Feng couldn't help but immediately put the fat man on a chair so that the fat man felt that at this time, Ye Feng had a very amazing strength. Not long after that, the Gong family's minions arrived. The three of them really underestimated Ye Feng and wanted to teach Ye Feng a special lesson. At this time, 
Chiang, who was in that place, also felt very happy, because soon there would be a great show. Chiang even dared to think that after Ye Feng was beaten to death by these members, he would be able to get the attention of Bai Yi and date her. Now meetings begin to occur between Ye Feng and the bald head gang leader, and when confronted, Ye Feng directly insulted the bald head by saying a bald head was just trash that dared to challenge him. The bald head and his gang were currently completely enraged and were about to beat up Ye Feng immediately. At first they told Ye Feng to make a choice. The first choice was for Ye Feng to kneel down and apologize to him so he could survive. And the second option is that Ye Feng must suffer death because he has to face him. Such special threats definitely did not frighten Ye Feng. This time he showed his aura personally to the bald head. The bald head felt the aura of a devil's presence that was very strong and made himself really afraid of Ye Feng's figure. That fear made the bald man start to hesitate to attack but he started to convince himself that he was currently hallucinating. Baldhead and his friends still ignored Ye Feng's warning, so then Ye Feng would give a choice to all of them. They all now started to become silent, as if they were hypnotized. Ye Feng then, without thinking twice, ordered everyone to immediately kneel before him. The Chiang who was there initially laughed at the situation because there was no way these criminal gangs would kneel before Ye Feng. But soon the criminal members immediately knelt with that, of course, making Chiang really very surprised because he didn't expect that these strong people had to kneel before Ye Feng. Chiang tried to revive the bald head, but it still didn't work. In fact, what Ye Feng was currently doing was telling the messengers that Chiang was the Ye Feng they were looking for. With this condition, of course, the bald head and friends immediately looked at Chiang. Chiang was completely powerless, and soon Chiang was beaten to a pulp by a gang of bald heads. Even though Chiang tried to fight Chiang, he was still beaten hard by the bald head gang. His fat friend Ye Feng could only be speechless when he knew the prowess that Ye Feng currently possessed. Not only Fatty, the other students who were there also felt confused why the bald head gang beat up Chiang instead. At this time, Chiang was really seriously injured. After that, the bald head gang immediately left the place in a state that was still hypnotized. For all of these circumstances, his friend Ye Feng, who was fat, was trying to ask Ye Feng about whether Ye Feng was currently still a human, or had become a devil. Time passed, and the teacher who was in Ye Feng's class arrived. The teacher then saw Chiang's battered condition and tried to ask what had happened, but Chiang said if nothing had happened to him, he would have just fallen unconscious. In short, class was about to start soon. But Ye Feng felt something strange about the teacher, where he could tell if the teacher's body had a strange aroma. The blood of the teacher was red and purple, and her eyes were fixed on her as if this blood was the blood that was most sought after to increase her cultivation ability. Knowing this, Ye Feng also said that if he managed to get a drop of blood, then he would be able to make a magic pill which of course could increase his prowess. This was like an extra life for Ye Feng. When the teacher passed her, Ye Feng immediately slapped her ass, because Ye Feng had killed one thing. And yes, at this time Ye Feng managed to kill a mosquito that, unexpectedly, this mosquito had sucked the blood of the teacher. The teacher was really angry with this situation because Ye Feng was very impolite, and so Ye Feng was kicked out of the class. Even so, Ye Feng was very happy, because he had managed to get a drop of blood from the teacher. He also found a unique fact about the mosquito, where according to Ye Feng, this mosquito is a demonic animal that basically only exists in the forbidden area of the universe. But this time, he is in the human world. In the evening, Ye Feng went to a club with his fat man friend. The fat man was always called Fatty by Ye Feng. Fatty there, without a second thought, immediately poured his heart out to Ye Feng, revealing that he had broken up with his girlfriend just because his girlfriend mocked Ye Feng. Fatty was truly a loyal friend. After that, Fatty immediately ordered a drink to Wei, who was on duty at the club. Fatty ordered two drinks of wine, and Wei was about to make them right away. But before that, Ye Feng told Wei that Wei was currently in a poisoned state, because it was caused by someone who poisoned him. Ye Feng revealed that soon the evil person who poisoned him would arrive, and according to Ye Feng, it was already at the door of the bar. Sure enough. Soon a shabby man immediately came to the club and immediately asked about Wei's condition. The man also knew about Wei's current condition of being poisoned because he was the main cause. He plans to help Wei in order to detoxify the poison, 
but with a reward. This man was also known as the Poison Wolf, and everyone present was completely speechless at that state of affairs. But then Wei told all the visitors that anyone who can help him defeat this Poison Wolf will get a very good prize where this bar will be free for life. Hearing all that one of the well-built visitors will immediately eradicate the Poison Wolf. The burly man is known by a nickname that is Tiger from the Black Market. Poison Wolf originally told Tiger not to interfere with his matters. But Tiger instead insisted that he was able to deal with the Poison Wolf, and without a second thought, immediately kicked the Poison Wolf out of there. The battle started to happen. The attack from Tiger was successfully broken by the Poison Wolf. After successfully cancelling the attack, the Poison Wolf immediately countered its attack with a clear punch towards Tiger's body with ease. The Tiger is now lying down and cannot get up again. In this situation, the Poison Wolf was very, very confident. He asked Wei who else was ready to finish him off. Wei, who was in that position, really panicked because he thought that there would be no more people who could beat the Poison Wolf. This Poison Wolf was truly overbearing. He then directly threw Tiger's body right at Fatty, causing Fatty a bit of pain. It wasn't long before Ye Feng immediately let out a voice saying, Did the Poison Wolf recognize him? The Poison Wolf didn't care about it, and immediately chased Ye Feng away from this place. The Poison Wolf initially tried to touch Ye Feng, but immediately his arm could no longer be moved. The Poison Wolf didn't stop there. He immediately launched his first attack which aimed directly at Ye Feng's body. But in an instant, Ye Feng disappeared from that place, and instead turned to attack the Poison Wolf from behind, so that at this time the Poison Wolf was sprawled and cornered against the wall. With this situation, Poison Wolf realized that the opponent he was currently facing was really strong. He also glimpsed Ye Feng's figure as the Devil God's truly deadly figure. Even though his current position was already lost, he didn't give up and directly threw another punch at Ye Feng. But again, his attack didn't hit at all. Instead at this time he was beaten to a pulp by Ye Feng. The Poison Wolf was completely sprawled on the floor and couldn't get up again. But again, even though it was in a really bad condition like this, the Poison Wolf still didn't give up, causing Ye Feng to immediately issue a punch that immediately shattered the floor. But the Poison Wolf managed to avoid it and tried to reverse the attack by throwing poison needles. And this time he thought he had hit Ye Feng's body. But unexpectedly the attack was caught by Ye Feng with his mouth, and he started to get emotional with this situation. Without thinking, Ye Feng lunged at the Poison Wolf and directly smashed the head of the Poison Wolf into the floor, causing the place to collapse instantly. Right now the Poison Wolf really couldn't get up again, and he no longer had the ability to fight anymore. He told Ye Feng that he had given up, and he immediately took out an antidote to heal Wei. The antidote was his special tooth and it was then given to Ye Feng to heal Wei. Wei's rescue mission has now been completed and successfully carried out. But soon Zhang arrives, who is the grandfather's assistant from the Bai family, who was fond of fishing before. Zhang was currently suffering from an injury to his hand, and he was unexpectedly the brother figure of the Poison Wolf. He called Zhang as brother. He asked Zhang why he was here. And Zhang then said that his purpose here was to meet the boss named Ye Feng. The Poison Wolf really didn't expect that this situation would happen. He no longer knew who to turn to for help. And in the end, Zhang and Poison Wolf apologized and bowed to Ye Feng. Immediately afterwards, Zhang immediately told Ye Feng that his purpose in coming here was specifically to see him. Zhang thought that Ye Feng could cure Grandpa's illness so that it can be said that Ye Feng's previous prediction was true, because now Grandfather was in a dying condition. Even though Ye Feng had not seen Grandfather's condition, he already knew about Grandfather's current state, where Grandfather had experienced countless dark spots appearing on every body, and his muscles also frequently twitched in the middle of the night, and this was all his doing, from the bite of the devil mosquito. Knowing this, Ye Feng will immediately help Grandpa to return the favor for Bai Yi's previous kindness. Ye Feng said he would prepare everything within three days, and he would immediately carry out the healing. Zhang at this time was very grateful and hurried away from there. Under these circumstances, the Poison Wolf was really speechless, especially now that eldest brother Zhang had done something like this, and bowed down towards Ye Feng. Not long after, 
Zhang immediately knelt in front of Ye Feng to ask for help from Ye Feng regarding the poison wolf. Zhang said that from this moment the poison wolf was Ye Feng's subordinate who was willing to do anything. Poison wolf was now completely friendly even to that fatty. Meanwhile, with everything going on, Ye Feng felt that there was something wrong with those demonic mosquitoes. He was about to find out everything and Ye Feng then walked out. And at this time he met Lin instead. He saw from a distance the figure of Lin who was currently waiting for the car, and when Ye Feng saw that suddenly, Lin was kidnapped by a group of people. Lin was then forced into the car so he couldn't do anything. This made Ye Feng very curious about what would happen next so he didn't think much, and immediately followed the car. In short, the car has now arrived at a remote village which is the house owned by Ye Feng. Those who would enjoy Lin's body there, and then they accused Ye Feng of doing everything, so that the one blamed later would be Ye Feng, so that would make Ye Feng suffer forever. Their plan was really cunning and they then immediately brought Lin into a room. The three thugs without a second thought would immediately enjoy Lin's body, but soon Ye Feng arrived at the place. Ye Feng said that they would all die here soon, and knowing this the third brother of the gang immediately tried to attack, but the attack was really weak and was successfully broken by Ye Feng. Unmitigated, even this time Ye Feng, without thinking, immediately absorbed the energy from the boy so that nothing remained and his body became like a brittle stone. The third brother actually died miserably, causing the other two people to be frightened and without thinking, twice apologized in front of Ye Feng. The two criminals also confirmed that they were only ordered by the figure of Ye Hu, the same person who previously intended to take revenge against Ye Feng due to his car explosion. After knowing that name, Ye Feng, without further ado, immediately killed the two criminals very cruelly. And when he finished doing that, he unexpectedly found a bright green pendant emitting a unique aura, and that pendant was one that was commonly used for various healing processes. This pendant could be named as a heavenly magic stone, and with this stone, he could absorb the devilish energy around him in order to speed up his strength recovery. He then rushed to a tree that was behind the house to plant it into the tree. With this tree, he can absorb boundless energy, and this can excite most of the people around him. He then directly blended the jade into the large tree so that it blended together extremely stably. Now the plants in this place will soon thrive, and this makes the energy healing process faster to do. From now on this place was the best place to carry out strength recovery for Ye Feng. But soon Ye Feng felt the presence of someone, and that person was none other than Lin which at that time Lin was really out of control, where Lin wanted to invite Ye Feng to play immediately. In this condition, Ye Feng tried to control himself and tried to stabilize the energy from the uncontrollable Lin. Ye Feng immediately fought back, so that in the end it made Lin speechless. In short, Ye Feng managed to do his job and now Lin is back to normal, but in an unconscious state. To Ye Feng himself, this is a high-level world favor. Meanwhile, the next day the sun had risen, and again Lin looked annoyed at Ye Feng because Ye Feng was the one with him when he opened his eyes naked. Ye Feng tried to stay calm while saying that he was the one who saved Lin earlier. Lin couldn't do much because he realized that this time Ye Feng was the one who saved him from the people who kidnapped him, and he only thanked Ye Feng. Then Ye Feng gave his clothes to Lin to put back on, and they intended to rush away from that place immediately. They would soon leave by using a car and the driver would be Lin because at that time Ye Feng did not have a driver's license. The journey back to the city began, and it didn't feel like an unexpected situation occurred on the streets, where they accidentally saw a car trying to block the car they were driving. The car belongs to Ye Hu, who is trying to avenge all the grudge he had against Ye Feng before. Ye Feng warned Lin not to mess around and not to leave the car because it would be very dangerous outside. Not long after that, Ye Hu came out and was completely in a state of confidence, even though the burn wound on his face was still not completely healed. Ye Hu was really very happy. He showed his face of satisfaction, and he really intended to kill Ye Feng immediately. And for Ye Feng himself, this would be a very interesting battle. An attack was now immediately launched by Ye Hu. The attack was so fast that it even made Ye Feng a little surprised because for Ye Feng this was the first time for him to see Ye Hu's abilities grow so rapidly after leaving the hospital. Ye Hu was now completely satisfied with his new ability. He also apologized to Ye Feng that his shot had missed a bit. 
Attack after attack continued to be launched by Ye Hu, and this slightly made Ye Feng have to be alert. The battle is now more interesting because Ye Hu continues to deliver devastating attacks towards Ye Feng. He was quite panicked by this situation, especially since Ye Hu was really fast, and without thinking, Ye Hu immediately gave a very large attack to Ye Feng. The combination of the two powers was really balanced, so that Ye Hu immediately used a mask that could increase his abilities. This way Ye Hu was sure he could finish off Ye Feng. Under these circumstances, Ye Feng finally realized that the mask Ye Hu was wearing was the mask of the Shura warrior from Devil Star. Ye Feng still doesn't know why Ye Hu can have the mask, but what is clear with the mask is that Ye Hu's strength is now increasing sharply. The attack had started by Ye Hu and almost left Ye Feng powerless to do evasion. Ye Hu is now really confident. He is confident and able to kill Ye Feng at this very second. A fierce fight started between Ye Feng and Ye Hu who was wearing a Shura mask now attacked very brutally. The attack was quite powerful for Ye Feng. He had quite a hard time with that situation. He also realized that attacks like this were due to using the mask. Ye Hu seemed to be able to use about 20% of the Shura warrior's power. But when the fight heated up, Lin got out of the car and wanted to see what was really going on. In this situation, Lin then wondered who the figures of the two of them were because their prowess was so powerful. Back to the battle arena. Where at this time the battle was heating up, Ye Hu and also Ye Feng put out all the abilities they had. Ye Hu's powerful attack almost made him more confident. He even had time to ridicule Ye Feng who seemed to always dodge at this time. Ye Feng in that state didn't want to give up. He put up a fight. But he was hit by a right punch in the stomach which made him vomit blood and was sent flying backwards. When Ye Feng was thrown away like that, Ye Hu still didn't leave Ye Feng. He immediately issued a follow-up attack. But this time Ye Feng managed to avoid it. But when the second attack was launched, Ye Feng was instead hit by a very powerful blow that made Ye Hu really feel confident that he could beat Ye Feng. He said that if his current strength was really great, and no one would be able to match him. Ye Hu became very arrogant in such a state. But soon Ye Feng suddenly said about one thing, where actually Ye Hu didn't know about the mask he had used. A slightly different condition now, Ye Feng explained to Ye Hu about the true meaning of the mask. The mask belonged to the Shura warrior, and the Shura warrior himself was the weakest warrior on Demonic Star. Shura masks are masks that increase the wearer's powers so that the person wearing them does not flee from battle, and only by dying or calming down the fight using the mask can they release them. So basically, the mask cannot be removed unless the user dies or wins the battle. Despite getting such an explanation, Ye Hu remained calm. He was more and more confident that he would soon eliminate Ye Feng. Ye Hu began to attack, but he lost quickly to Ye Feng, so this time his body was thrown far back. Ye Feng started to show his seriousness in this fight. Unsparingly, even the aftermath of the attack just now made the Asura mask break instantly. Even though he was injured, Ye Hu still didn't give up. He gathered his energy to attack Ye Feng again. A deadly attack was immediately launched by Ye Hu towards Ye Feng. But Ye Feng did not avoid it. He instead pitted his strength so that the two great powers were now fighting it out. Ye Hu was getting more and more subdued by that situation. Unmitigated, even this time his arm was devoured by Ye Feng's demonic energy. Slowly his body was about to be used up by that energy. But here Ye Hu still didn't stay still. He wanted to plot something where he intended to die with Ye Feng. Because there was no other choice, Ye Hu immediately enlarged his body to do the finisher attack. When he did, it was all just a pointless act, because the effect of Ye Feng's demonic energy was truly astonishing. Ye Hu didn't even have time to make another attack, so inevitably he would soon perish as a result of the attack issued by Ye Feng directly split Ye Hu's body into two parts. When he did, it was all just a pointless act, because the effect of Ye Feng's demonic energy was truly astonishing. Ye Hu didn't even have time to make another attack, so inevitably he would soon perish as a result of the attack issued by Ye Feng directly split Ye Hu's body into two parts. When he did, it was all just a pointless act, because the effect of Ye Feng's demonic energy was truly astonishing. Ye Hu didn't even have time to make another attack, so inevitably he would soon perish 
as a result of the attack issued by Ye Feng directly split Ye Hu's body into two parts. Ye Hu is now dying in a very cruel way, and Ye Feng wants to ask Ye Hu directly about who gave the Shura mask to him. But because Ye Hu had died, so Ye Feng would seek answers through his soul. Ye Feng started to do something, where he bit Ye Hu's soul so he indirectly got an answer where the Shura mask belonged to the Gong family. Upon this discovery, he would immediately investigate further, and after everything was settled, he told Lin if everything was fine. Lin was also very dumbfounded by this situation. He was sure that Ye Feng's figure was not an ordinary human being, especially with all the chaos that was in front of his eyes at this time. Shortly after that, Ye Feng asked Lin one thing about where he could find some good information as he was about to do some research soon. Lin, who heard that, then stated that it was possible that the Jiang City School Library could provide that information, because the library was also the largest library in Jiang City. Ye Feng rushed there accompanied by Lin. On the way, Lin kept wondering to Ye Feng that where did Ye Feng get such great power as life from? Hearing that Ye Feng just ignored Lin's unreasonable questions, then when he got to his destination and was about to leave Lin immediately, he told Lin to contact him if he had any problems, and he would immediately come if Lin was in danger. After all the events that Ye Feng had gone through, he also felt that this world was quite strange. He wasn't sure why the Shura Mask and the Poison Wolf could appear in a place like this, even though they all came from his planet long ago. He was also still confused about why suddenly so many demonic mosquitoes had appeared on this earth, and he felt the need to do some research to find out what was really going on. Under such circumstances, unexpectedly a female followed Ye Feng from behind. The little boy secretly immediately covered Ye Feng's eyes while asking Ye Feng, Who am I? Ye Feng was quite surprised when he saw that figure, because it was similar to Huang, who used to be very loyal to him in the Hell Realm. The girl herself is actually named Qian, and she is Ye Feng's childhood friend, whose body is currently occupied by the Demon King. Qian's purpose in coming to visit Ye Feng was to invite Ye Feng to come to attend his birthday event, which would be held shortly and organized by his friend. Ye Feng didn't have any special reason to refuse, so he would come to the birthday event as well. It turns out that the birthday event will be held soon in a very luxurious hotel. Before entering there, Ye Feng felt that something was wrong with this situation as he was sure that something was planned. Qian then met his friend who was planning this birthday event. There, Qian's friend welcomed Qian very well, which made Qian happy. Qian also introduced Ye Feng to all the visitors in that place. Then a blonde-haired man took a glass of drink and offered it to Qian. Ye Feng understood what was going to be planned, so Ye Feng invited the man to talk manly. Not long after they were talking, something unexpected happened, where the yellow-haired man said, if he was sent by Gong Yun Feng to simply give a special warning to Ye Feng, who had dared to mess with Lin. Then he got really annoyed and immediately brought the man to his knees. The man really begged for mercy, while Ye Feng himself told the man to convey one thing where he wanted to meet directly with the man's superior. The man named Young Master Hu was ordered by Ye Feng to immediately arrange a meeting between Ye Feng and Gong Yun Fei. Young Master Hu, who was in such a position, really didn't know what was going on, so he complied with all orders given by Ye Feng, and he was also about to come to a place where Gong Yun Fei would later attend. Before going there, Ang Si Dan as well as Ye Feng had to part ways temporarily because Chang would be returning home soon. After that, Ye Feng asked to be escorted to a destination that was none other than an abandoned steel factory. Young Master Hu had no other choice but to accompany Ye Feng for now. But when he was about to leave, Ye Feng unexpectedly got a phone call from the Poison Wolf, saying that currently Fatty had disappeared. Upon Fatty's disappearance, Ye Feng would have to help him immediately. In short, Ye Feng and also Young Master Hu have now arrived at a place where it turns out that he is planning to frame Ye Feng. Actually, Gong Yung Fei wasn't here. There was only someone who was sent to kill Ye Feng. Ye Feng, who was framed and fooled like this, couldn't help but smile, and then asked Young Master Hu whether all of this was arranged by Young Master Gong. He then replied that it was true, but was it possible that Ye Feng could have done something if he knew it was because of Gong Yun Fei because he was a truly terrible person? and would never let go of anyone who dared to go against him. Ye Feng really wasn't afraid of that threat, and without thinking twice, Ye Feng immediately blew up the car so that young Master Hu was also killed there. 
Meanwhile seen in a warehouse, now Fatty is being tortured by the bald head who was hypnotized by Ye Feng yesterday. Bald still did not want to give up. He said that yesterday's hypnosis incident was a small mistake for him. Baldi wanted to immediately take revenge for what Ye Feng did. This person was the errand of Gong Yun Feng who was assigned to kill Ye Feng tonight. Not long after that came Ye Feng who immediately showed himself to his enemies. He now started to step forward. But when he stepped it turned out that the six-finger snake had disappeared from its place and immediately attacked Ye Feng. The attack that was fired obviously meant nothing to Ye Feng because it would be too easy to read. Ye Feng even boasted that a worm like this wasn't worth sending to finish him off. This was self-deprecation. The snake didn't stop there. He was going to swallow all the nonsense Ye Feng said with his snake skills. He immediately put up a super extra resistance that went straight to Ye Feng's body. But this attack can be broken with a pet owned by Ye Feng that resembles a black cat. Ye Feng, who was quite irritated, then immediately put up an attack resistance, and this time made Snake have to be able to survive himself. Snake, which was now threatened, immediately took out a deracinating King Cobra, which was much bigger than before, and had two heads. With the two-headed Cobra, Ye Feng sent his spirit paint to immediately put up a fight. Right now his spirit paint was quite smart because previously it had managed to absorb the blood vitality that he got from the teacher. In other words, this battle would be a battle between whose spirit was much stronger. The two cobra heads immediately gave a full attack toward the spirit cat, but the spirit cat managed to break it and immediately bit the body of the cobra. But even that didn't mean anything to the big cobra, which then sent the spirit paint flying backwards. The cobra was now trying to attack Ye Feng directly. When carrying out the attack, it was unexpected that the six-finger snake even lost control of its own cobra, unmitigated. Ye Feng looked like he was about to give Six-Finger Snake a right punch in the face, but Six-Finger Snake managed to escape, and he immediately asked who Ye Feng really was, whether Ye Feng was from a sect or from somewhere. Ye Feng then explained that if he came from hell, the Six-Finger Snake still didn't want to give up. He would send Ye Feng back to hell. For that annoyance, Six-Finger Snake immediately brought out his best abilities, which this time he also took out a green snake that was so big. The snake instantly cast an attack technique right in front of Ye Feng, but again Ye Feng managed to cancel it, and managed to tear the snake's body into pieces making it defenseless. Under these conditions, there was nothing else the six-finger snake could do other than run away. He was trying to escape from Ye Feng. Ye Feng, who saw that, was even more furious because the six-finger snake was a loser figure that only ran away, which was said to be a loser, making the current six-finger snake really angry and he would quickly release his secret technique. The secret technique is the fusion of two giant cobras so that now their form becomes very different and becomes reddish. The snake's form is now more and more and is known as the Scarlet Python. Python was rampaging uncontrollably and had no other choice and was about to fight him. Scarlet Python is now increasingly transforming into a really scary cobra figure. The cobra figure is now being defeated by a little boy who is part of the figure being cared for by Ye Feng. The little demon boy now easily devoured the big cobra so that there was nothing left. In this situation there was no way for Six-Finger Snake. The state of surrender was not only felt by the Six-Finger Snake because at this moment the bald head was also experiencing the same thing. He could not escape from that place. Six-Snake Finger and also the bald head are now trapped in Ye Feng's area. He is really in a furious state of anger. He doesn't give Six Snake Finger a single chance to escape. Their Snake Finger keeps begging him not to be killed. Ye Feng eventually gave up, and now he will not kill the Six Finger Snake, but make it into something. Snake Finger was now transformed by Ye Feng into the shape of a bomb. One could say that this kind of punishment was far worse than death. Now Snake Finger totally changed into a bomb. Ye Feng was very happy with this situation because with this bomb which came from flesh and blood it would give a very great explosive effect. With his discovery, he immediately sent this bomb to a figure named Gong, without thinking twice, how it will be delivered later through the body of the bald head. But before that, Ye Feng without thinking twice immediately freed his best friend. When he finished with his best friend, he immediately placed a bomb on the bald head. The bald head was then hypnotized again by Ye Feng so that at this time all orders from Ye Feng would be obeyed. Ye Feng then immediately put the bomb into the bald head's mouth, 
so that in this state the bomb was well hidden in the bald head's belly. At any time the bomb would be detonated by Ye Feng, if the destination had arrived. The bald head was then ordered to return to his boss, Gong Yunfei. Fatty really did not expect that with the situation that had happened, especially now that all the injuries he had experienced seemed to have disappeared instantly because Ye Feng had healed them. This made him even more sure that Ye Feng was not a human being anymore. Back to the bald head side, where at this time he also managed to arrive and meet the figure of his boss. The encounter at first made Gong Yunfei happy, because he felt if the current Ye Feng had died. But when Gong Yunfeng looked at the bald head, the bald head could only say, if he had come to present himself with a gift. It wasn't long before the bald head began to become very wild and strange that this made Gong Yunfei notice, and he hurriedly left the place just before a huge explosion occurred. The next day, Ye Feng went to a hotel where the teacher was with her friend. At that place, the teacher introduced her friend named Qin She by saying, if he is a doctor who is currently the manager of the largest private institution for healthcare in the city of Jiang, he came to Ye Feng because he wanted to know about the demonic mosquito that Ye Feng had killed before while Master was teaching. Qin Shui tried to ask Ye Feng why Ye Feng could know about the devil mosquito, even though the Ministry of Health had not leaked it at all. So the only people who knew about the case were the health authorities. Hearing that question, Ye Feng didn't answer at all, which made Qin Shui quite annoyed. Qin Shui said that even if he couldn't explain all that, then Qin Shui had good reasons to suspect Ye Feng because of the appearance of the demon mosquito. Even though threatened like that, Ye Feng was not afraid he even said that this was none of his business anymore. Thank you for inviting us to eat here, said Ye Feng, and he hurriedly left the place. But the teacher and her friends kept trying to prevent Ye Feng from leaving. When Ye Feng was leaving, he was blocked by several troops where the troops were led by Bai Zheng Guo from the Bai family or you could say the family of a grandfather who liked fishing some time ago. That person was none other than Bai Yi's father, where he revealed that he had come to this place to ask Ye Feng for help in order to save his father's life. Because his father is currently suffering from a serious illness. Without thinking, Ye Feng would rush to leave. But again Qin Shui said, if he wanted to know the treatment process carried out by him, he was even willing to become Ye Feng's disciple if Ye Feng was very good at treating. Ye Feng and the others now immediately left that place to go to the place of the grandfather. Not far from the location of the spy sent by Gong Yunfei now started to carry out a plan, where he reported to Gong Yunfei that at this time, even Tenga came to the upper BIE family information. Gong Yunfei ordered his subordinates to immediately follow Ye Feng and provide the latest news. Meanwhile, now the news about the explosion of business buildings in the CBD city is now starting to spread all over the world. Even the police are still having trouble finding the real facts behind the incident. And for all the losses suffered by Gong Yong Fei, he also very much intends to finish off Ye Feng in his own way. Meanwhile, Ye Feng himself had returned to the Bai family's home when he was about to rush in to treat Grandpa. Qin Shui kept trying to follow Ye Feng because she wanted to know what healing method Ye Feng did. For this situation, Ye Feng also ordered Qin Shui to follow him and pay attention to him. Not long after that, Ye Feng and Qin Shui had arrived at the grandfather's room, and without thinking, Ye Feng immediately took out his ability by summoning spirit paint to immediately treat the grandfather. Ye Feng then took out the cat and the cat would also be used by Ye Feng to administer a substance. It turned out that the cat immediately secreted fluid from its body. Amidst this situation, they discussed about the Gong family, which is none other than very powerful in this city. Ye Feng then found out how strong the Gong family was, but soon Grandpa's grandson Bai Yi immediately explained, if there is anything stronger than the Gong family, that is the Leng family. The Leng family was a person who had always been in the shadows of the Gong family. A few moments later, Grandfather recovered, and he finally realized that the pain he was experiencing was due to the Gong family, and the carrier of the disease was a demonic mosquito. The demonic mosquito must be in a world unlike this, because it was only in Ye Feng's world before. Qin Shui, who heard that, was quite surprised because she felt that Ye Feng really wasn't human. Qin Shui's thoughts made Ye Feng warn him too. Never dig too deep for information, because if it got to the bottom one day, it would be really scary. 
With all that happened, Grandpa's grandson then thanked Ye Feng very much for saving his grandfather's life. Ye Feng then asked for a car in return from the Bai family, because there were many in that place. Ye Feng was given a car for transportation, and Uncle Zhong would also deliver it. With all that happened, Grandpa's grandson then thanked Ye Feng very much for saving his grandfather's life. Ye Feng then asked for a car in return from the Bai family, because there were many in that place. Ye Feng was given a car for transportation, and Uncle Zhang would also deliver it. With all that happened, Grandpa's grandson then thanked Ye Feng very much for saving his grandfather's life. Ye Feng then asked for a car in return from the Bai family, because there were many in that place. Ye Feng was given a car for transportation, and Uncle Zhang would also deliver it. When Uncle Zhang was about to deliver Ye Feng, who was still behind, suddenly a group of troops sent by the Gong family approached the place. The big man named Gui Shou tried to threaten Zhang by saying, Where is Ye Feng right now? If Zhang didn't want to tell that, then he wouldn't hesitate to destroy the Bai family. When the debate ensued, Ye Feng also now appeared by saying, Are you the only one that was sent by Gong to finish me off? Immediately the big man tried to attack Ye Feng, but Ye Feng managed to withstand the attack. This situation made the big man realize that Ye Feng was not to be trifled with. Ye Feng then immediately sped away as he ordered the big man to try and catch him. Now they arrived in a forest around his house. In that forest there was a tree that was once used by Ye Feng to store various energies. With this tree, Ye Feng tried to raise his stamina and gather all the aura in this forest. It could be said that areas like this were Ye Feng's cage area so that Ye Feng could freely beat up anyone who tried to attack him. A few moments later arrived the army of large men who at this time managed to find out where Ye Feng was. Gui Shou and his troops are now starting to explore the place to find traces of Ye Feng. They wanted to know where his whereabouts were hiding. After quite a long search they suddenly found a situation that was so strange, where one by one the guards were now killed by Ye Feng very cruelly. Even one by one they had to lose their heads. Ye Feng was about to attack very aggressively, once then welcomed to the playing area to Gui Shou. This was an area that could be said to be hell for his enemies. Ye Feng then took out his demonic abilities and tried to confine Gui Shou. Ye Feng then ordered Gui Shou to take the fight by attacking himself. When Ye Feng underestimated Gui Shou, suddenly Gui Shou turned out to be the arrival of another friend who was a demon. So then they were both going to face Ye Feng. Before Gong Yunfei ordered the two of them to finish off Ye Feng, that friend of Gui Shou named Kui Feng who was trying to attack Ye Feng from behind. Yet Ye Feng easily anticipated that. When Ye Feng was focused on Kui Feng so Gui Shou tried to attack with a high technique, that attack was able to throw Ye Feng quite far. Soon, Qi Feng was able to get back up and was currently roaring so loudly. Under these circumstances, Ye Feng resumed his attack, but unexpectedly his attack was broken by Gui Shou. Gui Shou took out an ability which attack now made Ye Feng helpless. Moreover, Qi Feng was now starting to try to block Ye Feng's body. Ye Feng was completely trapped and trapped unable to move a bit. Qi Feng told Ye Feng how dare a nameless person like you go against our team. Do you have enough courage? Qi Feng would also immediately kill Ye Feng in that place by biting Ye Feng's shoulder. Qi Feng would soon absorb all of Ye Feng's strength until all that was left were bones later. The attacks received by Ye Feng didn't stop there because Sun Gui Shou immediately gave a super strong technique, where the technique was then able to make a big hole in Ye Feng's chest. That technique was truly so lethal that even Ye Feng was thrown so far back. Ye Feng now looked weak and helpless as if he had perished. Qi Feng and Gui Shou also thought that they thought that this battle was over. Qi Feng will also soon eat Ye Feng's body. Even though Ye Feng is now weak and powerless, Gui Shou doesn't want to let it go. Gui Shou knows that this person defeated Six Finger, so that the place is now causing a very serious wound. After successfully defeating Ye Feng, the two of them discussed that Ye Feng's strength was only at level F, while they were both currently at level E, so they both could win this match. When they thought that everything was over, suddenly Ye Feng gave a direct attack to Qi Feng, causing him to fall to the ground just like that. Now his wound has started to heal completely and he will soon show the true power of a demon of hell. Gui Shou actually didn't know what was going on, because previously he had given such a strong attack, but now Ye Feng managed to stand firm. It didn't even hurt him in the slightest. 
This kind of situation made Qi Feng and Gui Shou really scared, especially now that Ye Feng was giving off a demonic aura that was so terrifying. Ye Feng started to get serious and carried out a heavy attack towards Gui Shou, especially now that Ye Feng was giving off a demonic aura that was so terrifying. Ye Feng started to get serious and carried out a heavy attack towards Gui Shou, especially now that Ye Feng was giving off a demonic aura that was so terrifying. Ye Feng started to get serious and carried out a heavy attack towards Gui Shou. Ye Feng also managed to give Gui Shou a deep enough wound that made Gui Shou and Kui Feng start to feel worried if they would fail to beat Ye Feng. Under these circumstances, Ye Feng said that it seemed like they had predicted the wrong circumstances for his strength because Ye Feng was a truly formidable figure. Unmitigated Ye Feng has now managed to turn the sky there into darkness instantly. The devil's influence felt by the two enemies is really very painful. They seem to be trapped in that place and can't run anywhere. In times like this, Ye Feng would give the two of them an opportunity, where among the two of them there would be one left alive. Gui Shou, who didn't accept that, then immediately tried to attack Ye Feng. He gathered all his energy to immediately put pressure on Ye Feng's place in that place. The efforts made by this Gui Shou guy now didn't change at all. He was completely trapped in that place because currently this place was a place of darkness that belonged to Ye Feng. Even though it was like that, the Gui Shou continued to attack, and he pitted his great strength against Ye Feng's dark power. The battle is back fierce and unmitigated, now the battle between the two sides will be even more intense with the help of Kui Feng. It seemed like this would be quite a tough fight for Ye Feng. Even so, Ye Feng also told them both, if it seems they both prefer to die, at such moments Ye Feng said, if one of them dared to open up about their true form, then Ye Feng would let one of them live. Not long after, Qi Feng suddenly revealed his own true identity, so that at this time, Gui Shou's condition was threatened. He really didn't expect this behavior from his best friend, because it was tantamount to self-destruction, Ye Feng said. If he did this because he wanted to live and didn't want to die in this place, and Qi Feng then, without thinking, immediately made an attack. Right at Gui Shou, he did this because he didn't want to die, and he wanted to make Gui Shou a ghoul who could have greater potential than humans. Ghouls can be said to be demons which Kai Feng will tame later. He still tried to attack, but his attack didn't mean anything to Ye Feng. Ye Feng, who was getting more emotional, then immediately finished off the Gui Shou so terrifyingly that there was not a single one left. Not long after, only Qi Feng was left. Qi Feng was then immediately changed by Ye Feng to become a pill. With this condition and with all that happened, the condition of the tree that had been helping Ye Feng now began to wither and crumble instantly. As if there was no more life in the tree. With this situation also made Ye Feng say that the two people earlier had made him do everything very complicated and also sure that now he was at the top level and his opponent was at least at level F. Even so, Ye Feng still needed to be careful and will soon do a lot of things to improve again his ability. There it is also shown with the figure of a lion which is none other than the form of the current spirit paint. Ye Feng was also very happy about this because his spirit grew much faster and was much more powerful. Under these circumstances, Ye Feng would immediately investigate everything in great detail. Ye Feng also did not forget that he would continue to receive reinforcements from the Bai family because at the moment it was Ye Feng's only ally. Then when Ye Feng left, unexpectedly there was a woman in the surroundings, and that woman was none other than Qin Shui. Qin kept trying to investigate more about who Ye Feng really was. By getting all the information he saw earlier, he needed to report it to the main headquarters. He felt that this Ye Feng was a very, very dangerous person than they thought. Meanwhile, on the other hand, Gong Yunfei's allies still thought that how could an E-level expert be crushed by a human like Ye Feng? This ally of Gong Yunfei was known as Chu Li. He was a bit more dangerous than the previous two. Not only that, Gong Yunfei was also quite irritated by the whole situation he was in. He wanted to quickly find the strongest opponent who could finish off Ye Feng, even telling Chu Li to quickly find people who were much tougher. But Chu Li then said that it couldn't be done easily. Chu Li told Gong Yunfei that the current clan is still in contention, so finding strong people might need a little more effort. Even so, Gong Yunfei didn't care about that. He wanted to quickly prepare another expert who could match Ye Feng's ability. 
He was willing to do all of this because he wanted to see that Ye Feng kneel down and beg for mercy in front of Gong Yunfei. In other words, Gong Yunfei wanted to quickly find an expert whose level was much higher than before. Back with Ye Feng who is currently returning to meet his grandfather's grandson, Bai Yi. There, Ye Feng again asks for wages from what he did yesterday. He wants to have a house to live in for a while. Bai Yi was quite surprised by this situation, because yesterday he had given the car Ye Feng wanted. Even so, Bai Yi would still carry out Ye Feng's orders. At that place, Ye Feng also told about Qin who met him last night. Qin, who had previously visited and investigated Ye Feng, now asked Ye Feng whether it was true that Ye Feng was in the Ye family. Ye Feng said that if he really came from that family, it turns out that Qin did such a question because Qin wanted to find out if Ye Feng really wasn't an enemy of their organization because Qin didn't want to compete with Ye Feng. Under these circumstances, Ye Feng confirmed that he had nothing to do with Qin and that Qin organization. Meanwhile, at another location, Gong Yunfei was still angry with the circumstances and bad luck he had encountered. This Gong Yunfei came to a secret room where something really dangerous was stored. Something that was now held by Gong Yunfei. And when this Gong Yunfei will immediately bring up the idea when he wants to do it. Suddenly, there was a human being who tried to prevent it. He said that if Gong Yunfei was brave enough to come here without any escort, it was unmitigated now that the woman managed to snatch something precious from Gong Yunfei's hands. She told Gong Yunfei, if she will bring this item soon. It turns out that this item is none other than the demonic mosquito, which has been causing various strange events in the world, including making grandfather sick in the palace. Gong Yunfei was about to lose that demonic mosquito. Gong Yunfei tried to take it back, but the woman was really agile and couldn't be caught just like that. The woman was also not afraid at all of the Leng family behind the Gong family. This kind of situation made Gong Yunfei was very emotional. He was about to kill the woman immediately. He started to attack with the intention of killing the woman. The purpose of the end was that later he could be lifted by the Deviant Alliance which could raise his rank. Gong Yunfei started to issue heavy attacks right at the woman named Shun, but Shun dodged those attacks again and again. Gong Yunfei wanted to plan a special attack on Sik Sun, but Shun managed to evade it again, and with this kind of ability, Shun said that all his goals had been accomplished, and he had also obtained the item he wanted, so now he only needed to get away from this place. Shun ran away from there and Gong Yunfei lost something precious to him. Gong Yunfei being abandoned like that made him very angry, and he said that if you just wait, one day he will definitely kill Shun in a very cruel way. Returning to Ye Feng's side, who is currently holding a deadly weapon of his own. By having this weapon, of course, his strength and abilities will increase. He will also find out about all the irregularities in this world. Not long after, Ye Feng also has the arrival of a female figure, who is none other than Shun. Shun actually came to Ye Feng to give the demonic mosquitoes earlier, and was quite surprised by this. Moreover, he also didn't recognize Shun at all. He tries to find out about this Shun, but Shun refuses it. He doesn't want to reveal his identity first. Shun then rushed away from the place, but when he stepped away, Ye Feng didn't let that happen and told Shun to confess his true identity. But again, Shun said. Not long after, Ye Feng also ordered Poison Wolf to investigate it, because Poison Wolf knew a lot about this kind of information. Not long after that, the Poison Wolf also explained everything about this demonic mosquito and all its benefits. So a few moments later, Ye Feng came to a warehouse where Gong Yunfei was seen holding a beautiful girl hostage, and she was the Lin Lan, who had been always assisted by Ye Feng. The current Lin was not allowed to get away with it by Gong Yunfei, because Gong Yunfei really wanted to. Even so, Ye Feng was still not afraid of all the threats, because he currently needed an explanation as to why the Asura mask was in this world. Gong Yunfei didn't want to answer that either, and said, if he was going to tell him after Ye Feng was in hell, and then Gong Yunfei immediately gave a direct attack, but that attack was easily broken by Ye Feng. Such a small attack meant nothing to Ye Feng, and he now completely had the upper hand. But when he was off guard suddenly, Gong Yunfei attacked from behind so that it almost made Ye Feng injured. Fortunately again the attack was successfully broken by Ye Feng, who then admitted that currently Gong Yunfei had many tricks to carry out the attack. 
Gong Yunfei was starting to get a bit serious about this battle he was about to face. When he was getting serious, suddenly saw the figure of Chu Li who was currently helping Gong Yunfei. That means Ye Feng would soon be facing two enemies at once. Gong Yunfei was completely satisfied with this situation, because he was about to send this Ye Feng to hell, and the battle was now getting fiercer. Gong and Chu Li began to bring out their best abilities in front of Ye Feng. He now managed to carry out an attack with a high technique that allowed him to create so many female clones. A clone like this was capable of making hundreds of attacks much stronger. But when he took out the women, the clone unknowingly attacked Gong Yunfei himself. This also made Gong Yunfei really speechless. Ye Feng managed to control all of this, and even made it look as if Gong Yunfei ate his own weapon. When he was about to save Lin, suddenly Chu Li took out his abilities and began to clash with Ye Feng. That crushing attack had now succeeded in making Ye Feng completely fall down. Ye Feng even now looked as if his body had been stuck into the ground. At times like this, Chu Li emphasized one thing about the Deviant Organization which was quite strong. The Deviant Organization was also followed by Chu Li, and at that place Chu Li quite praised Ye Feng by saying, if Ye Feng had a pretty good defense. In this condition, Gong Yunfei also ordered Chu Li to immediately kill Ye Feng at this time. But again, Gong Yunfei's words were opposed by Chu Li, because Chu Li wanted to wait for another expert to arrive, so killing Ye Feng would be much easier. When Gong Yunfei carried out a high-level attack to get rid of Ye Feng, Ye Feng also brought out his best ability, namely taking out a demon baby. The baby had now managed to catch Gong Yunfei. But Gong Yunfei did not stay silent. He performed high-tech techniques again, so that in the end, he made a baby. Even then he was sprawled and helpless. He managed to beat the baby. At this time, Gong Yunfei was looking for the whereabouts of Ye Feng, who had suddenly disappeared. It was unexpected that Ye Feng was currently taking Lin away. Because Ye Feng didn't want anything to happen to Lin, he took him to a safe place so he could be saved. After successfully escorting Lin, Ye Feng returns to the battlefield and will finish everything. At the current battlefield, a poison wolf came with a demonic mosquito. This made Chu Li and Gong Yunfei feel strange. How could the poison wolf get this? Because if the poison wolf managed to use it, its abilities would increase greatly? Very. Sure enough. Not long after, the poison wolf immediately ate the demon mosquito, so that his body became much stronger, and his appearance was much more different. With this situation, poison wolf is sure if he is able to provide an effective game in this battle. The poison wolf was even giving off such a powerful aura that it made Gong Yunfei feel quite apprehensive. Here the wolf began to put up a fight. Fight was now going on in that place, so the wolf decided to attack. But because Gong Yunfei was a little overwhelmed, Chu Li tried to help him from behind. But it wasn't long before Chu Li finally realized that the wolf had disappeared and was now behind him. The wolf tried to attack Chu Li so that Chu Li's arm disappeared. Chu Li really couldn't save his right arm because it had been poisoned by the wolf because this also made Gong Yunfei come up with an idea that he would immediately cut off the arm and replace it with a new arm. Gong Yunfei is now giving a medicine that can then make Chu Li get his new arm again. For this situation, Chu Li is really very proud and he will soon use this arm as best he can. With all these circumstances, the wolves realized that Gong Yunfei was not to be trifled with. Even Gong Hyun had succeeded in performing a metal kinesis technique. Soon the wolf had to face the harsh reality that he received a heavy attack from Chu Li using his new arm, so that a huge explosion occurred in that place, and overwhelmed the wolf quite a bit. At times like that it was also shown by the imminent battle between Ye Feng and Gong Yunfei. Here Gong Yunfei was venting his anger, because he couldn't get the Leng clan, even though he really wanted that family name. This was possible, because the rule in this world was that family blood was the only solid foundation for survival and with all those emotions, Gong Yunfei would mindlessly devour him in this place. He also took out an ability with his high technique, which was then immediately replied by Ye Feng. Chu Li now carried out an attack, using his new arm that he had managed to get earlier, and he upgraded the giant arm technique which now succeeded in making it difficult for Ye Feng. Even so, Ye Feng with his devilish aura immediately tried to face Gong Yunfei, so that Gong Yunfei was now collapsed as a result of receiving such a frightening attack of darkness, 
At a time like this, Ye Feng also said that if Gong Yunfei, don't try to dare to finish him because he will never be able to forgive anyone who disturbs his life. Before his death, Gong Yunfei told Ye Feng that if he dared to kill him, then the Deviant Alliance would never let Ye Feng go, and the Lung family would also never let this all happen. Surely many parties would seek revenge against Ye Feng. In this state, Ye Feng didn't feel afraid at all, because he was a demon king, which basically he always got a lot of threats. With that, he immediately used the final technique to kill Gong Yunfei until his head was cut off. Gong Yunfei died instantly, and in this condition Chu Li was really angry and devastated. He didn't expect that Ye Feng would dare to do that which would cause such big trouble in the end. Ye Feng really wasn't afraid of anyone's words. He just focused on his stance. Different from the wolf's response where the wolf said that Chu Li should now shed tears because his master was gone. The same response was also made by Ye Feng, where Ye Feng warned Chu Li by saying that he was ready to do anything to deal with the Deviant Alliance. These words from Ye Feng made Chu Li a little worried, because of course his mother from Gong Yunfei would not allow this, and it was very likely that Ye Feng could be hunted down by everyone in this city, and Ye Feng became someone who was really being chased by assassins. Even so, Ye Feng was never afraid of anything. Under these circumstances, Chu Li was quite frightened because his life would soon be finished. But soon came the figure of a man wearing a hat who immediately took Chu Li away from that place. Poison Wolf tried to prevent it, but Ye Feng forbade it because Ye Feng wanted to let things get complicated and get really wild. This was done by Ye Feng because his main purpose in coming to this place was to regain the position of the Demon Lord, and how could he possibly be defeated in a world like this? He would train his skills to become a truly fearsome demon king figure. Ye Feng and the poison wolf immediately left the place. But before that, Ye Feng told the wolf that the poison wolf must always protect the people Ye Feng knows, and at least the wolf must have top ranking power according to their methods. Determining the level of strength is done so that the poison wolf is able to complete every mission given by Ye Feng later. The poison wolf would definitely carry out all of Ye Feng's orders. The next day a conversation took place between Chu Li and a man in a hat named Mr. Zhao. There they discussed, how would the Lang family possibly handle this matter? Zhao who heard that then said that at this time, Ye Feng was close to the Bai family, so there was a possibility that the other families would not dare to attack. This place itself was the place of the Deviant Alliance, but soon Gong Yunfei's mother arrived. Gong Yunfei's mother named Li Han Shuang then explained to the visitors who were in this place that at this time she wanted to immediately carry out a contest to find the mastermind behind her son's death. Shuang also emphasized one thing where currently the Ghost Clan has officially made peace with their Deviance Alliance. So this naturally allowed them to decide on various matters to end this battle for a moment, because they would focus on finding the mastermind behind Gong Yunfei's death. In that place, Shuang also explained and emphasized one thing that if someone succeeded in killing the killer of his child, then the winner would get a truly unlimited wish that could be granted by the leaders. The people who were there were very happy, and they will soon finish this competition. While in a different place it was shown with Ye Feng together with Fatty, where they were currently discussing one thing. Fatty said that even if this Ye Feng was a reincarnated devil king or a university loser, he would always be with him because Ye Feng was his best friend there. Because Fatty's ability was very weak, Ye Feng also had an idea where Fatty would help him in managing resources. Not long after, when they were in the middle of discussing it, suddenly Poison Wolf reported one thing where Bai Yi's family wanted to meet with Ye Feng and discuss an important matter. Ye Feng then, without a second thought, immediately rushed to that place. In short, Ye Feng arrived there, and again met with Qin. Qin then told Ye Feng that he should thank himself, because all this time it was Qin who had been the guardian of Ye Feng's house. Even so, Ye Feng said that if this house wasn't built by his organization to benefit from Ye Feng, it was as if the two of them win-win, and no one can be indebted to in that place. Ye Feng asked what the true purpose of the Qin organization was, Chin then explained about his goal, which is to get a lot of extensive knowledge, because actually knowledge has no boundaries. Even in terms of cultivation, which is ultimately about harnessing external forces to strengthen oneself. From a scientist's point of view, this was all common sense, but Chin was still not sure where these powers came from. That is exactly what this organization has always cared about. 
So that way, only people like Ye Feng who can help him get closer to the origin of the power are qualified to be their friend. Just for example, like Ye Feng, who has very, very amazing abilities. Not long after they were having a conversation, suddenly Ye Feng was attacked by a human figure, who in fact came from the Qin organization. Qin really didn't imagine this was happening. Qin then tried to apologize to Ye Feng and explained everything that it could happen because there were so many members in the organization, so no one could control it. After that, Chin also invited Grandpa's grandson to join his organization, and the first goal Bai Yi had to do was to spy on Ye Feng and find out about everything related to Ye Feng. Then, from another perspective, Ye Feng was introduced, who was currently trying to find out about the situation in the underworld. He really couldn't stop thinking that he was wasted in a place like this. However, this is where he is now, and he must undertake a new journey that can unite beings like the Poison Wolf to strengthen his demonic empire again. Ye Feng tried to discuss with the Poison Wolf about their past life where in the past on the demon planet Ye Feng managed to defeat the Poison Wolf in its last evolution. Here Ye Feng asked whether the Poison Wolf hated this incident because that place could belong to the Poison Wolf. Hearing that, Poison Wolf then said that this place was not suitable for him because the one who deserved to obey. It was all Ye Feng. The Poison Wolf was able to speak like that because Ye Feng was aware that the huge difference in strength between them was so obvious. The Poison Wolf was no match for Ye Feng. And another fact that could make the Poison Wolf say that was that this Ye Feng was even capable of leading an entire demon planet. To break away from the control of other planets seemed to make Ye Feng a figure that truly could not be defeated and a figure that truly became number one. Poison Wolf even dared to say that if anything was ordered by Ye Feng, then he would obey without the slightest hesitation. And even though being chased like that, Ye Feng didn't want to stay silent. He invited Poison Wolf to immediately come to the Alliance of Deviants tonight to put on an exciting show. In short, Ye Feng also managed to arrive at the meeting location between the alliances where the location was previously obtained by Ye Feng from the information provided by Qin. Qin did that because he felt guilty about Ye Feng before being attacked by his members. Ye Feng arrives there. A man named Roy then asks if Ye Feng is really not afraid of death at this time, because in this club later it is highly likely that Ye Feng will not be able to come out alive. Ye Feng then said that the purpose of coming here was just to finish off the money, and he was then invited to enter by Roy. The big man was then ordered by Ye Feng to park his car immediately, and in such circumstances Roy also always reminded Ye Feng to be careful when he entered, because there were lots of assassins targeting Ye Feng. Sure enough in that place, you can see the great people who are currently discussing how they can beat Ye Feng. Then Ye Feng made it into a nightclub, where there were lots of assassins who intended to kill Ye Feng. When the killers talked unexpectedly, Ye Feng immediately met them all. Ye Feng easily broke down the door, and immediately threatening him, one of the assassins said, Do they really dare to take his life? The man who is currently being stepped on by Ye Feng dared to stare at Ye Feng very intently, as if he wanted to finish Ye Feng, so that without further ado, Ye Feng finished the figure first. The man. The ruthlessness displayed by Ye Feng made the other two assassins feel worried. They both seemed frightened by Ye Feng's figure when Ye Feng wanted to beat them up. Suddenly there was a big man who tried to attack him, but it turned out that the big man had now become Ye Feng's best friend, which of course was due to manipulation after being hypnotized by Ye Feng. That big man seemed to be going to carry out all the orders issued by Ye Feng. There Ye Feng had thought long and hard about ordering the big man to immediately finish off the two assassins who tried to attack him. Ye Feng was about to do that, but he thought again of using these two assassins as his puppet soldiers. The two people were now again successfully hypnotized by Ye Feng, and from now on, this place would belong to Ye Feng. Not long after that, Ye Feng also called Butterball, so he could manage this nightclub, because from now on it belonged to him. He then stepped back, but again and again he even met Qin. Ye Feng, who was confused by this situation, then asked Qin why Qin had come here to catch up with him. Qin then said that if he was ordered here by his organization to carry out a transfer of residence, in other words, Qin's purpose was to tell Ye Feng that Bai Yi had become his assistant and would become his substitute figure who would provide all the needs Ye Feng wanted. 
Ye Feng, who heard that, then said that actually he never wanted to ask for help from anyone because he was used to doing everything alone. Nevertheless, Ye Feng also accepted Bai Yi to be his assistant, and after that, Qin started explaining all the information about the organization, then explained that if Wang He of the Leaf was a large organization whose power could not even be predicted at all, the department in Jiang City where he was currently was only a part very small of the whole. According to legend, this organization thoroughly controls the governments around the world with enormous power with words and many resources at their disposal. Thus, because of the breadth of the organization, it was only natural that there would be debate within the organization, everyone using their own methods of doing what they thought was right about it. There is a large group influence that exists in an organization, and the Ghost Clan is a part of the organization. After saying that Kin told Ye Feng that soon it would be their last meeting because from now on he no longer wanted to meet Ye Feng, he would only give Ye Feng his final aid to report some information. Meanwhile, in a different place, it is shown the condition of the Ghost Clan which is currently being attacked by a group of troops. That group of troops is planning to do something tonight, which is they want to eradicate the Ghost Clan until there are no more left. This was because the Ghost Clan tried to disobey the organization after they carried out all the killing and massacres. They would immediately target Ye Feng's figure, who would become their next target. After that, it was shown again that Ye Feng met Shun's figure. Ye Feng's purpose for doing this was because Ye Feng really wanted to know the details about who this Shun figure really was. Ye Feng also wanted to find out the whereabouts of the Ghost Clansmen, because Shun was also from there. Shun is now forced to explain everything about who he really is. Shun then says about himself that he is part of the devils who are under the royal team. Ye Feng asked what Shun's real name was, and Shun then said that he used to be a royal guard named Tong Shun. She was a very wild girl, and Ye Feng recognized Shun's figure. Not long after that, Shun got a phone call from his friend, where he said that currently the condition of the ghost clan was really threatened because it was attacked by various forces. This situation made Shun and Ye Feng immediately head there. After that, it was shown with a figure named Luo Chun who came from a criminal clan. He was the head of the criminal clan who had finished fighting, and their goal here was to kill everyone who came from the ghost clan. Not only the ghost clan, they would also immediately finish off Ye Feng in this place. Luo Chun also said about one thing that the killer wouldn't just be from their ranks, because there would be five specters who were famous for their ruthlessness who would become Ye Feng's hunters. They all have their own abilities and characteristics in committing crimes. In that place they are deliberately gathered by a man who wants to use their abilities. When they were gathered like that Luo Chen was getting even worse. He seemed to want to fight with five specters. The feud is now heating up. But all of that was stopped by a man who just came. That man named Hua Qing who is the leader of all the current alliance troops. Hua King was known as the head of a criminal clan whose level of power was clearly different from the people in that place. Hua Qing had even emphasized to his members back then that if he dared to cause trouble, he would not hesitate to make a heavy punishment for all of them. With this situation, everyone is now obedient and submissive to Hua Qing's words. Hua Qing then resumed his words, where at this time they weren't just aiming to kill Ye Feng, but they were going to get rid of Shun soon, because they were considered very troubling to the five specters. A few moments later now, Ye Feng and also Shun were stuck in a traffic jam. There they were really frustrated in such a situation, because this would certainly slow down their path to their mission, and because this took too long to make Ye Feng furious, he immediately did a diversion where he immediately breaks through a new shortcut. In other words, he manages to gain an ability to drive a car very fast and get to his destination very, very quickly. When they were traveling, Shun saw a woman who was none other than his nemesis. Shun then immediately met the woman's figure, and it didn't take long. When the two of them managed to meet, Shun immediately gave a heavy attack towards the woman, but Shu Shu overcame that and tried to counterattack Shu Shi's kick, nearly wounding Shun. But now the fight is getting more balanced without half hearted. Now Shun managed to tear the clothes worn by Shi Shi. In such a situation, it was seen that there were two specters who were watching the fight between the two of them. Not only the two, 
There were also five specters who would soon gather their abilities to defeat Ye Feng. They started to place road restrictions so the car worn by Ye Feng was now forced to a halt. Ye Feng immediately rushed out and was about to deal with it. The attack that Ye Feng was about to get was not only from the fifth spectrum, but from Shi Shi's figure. Shi Shi was a member of the Elite Three Combat Unit, the ability of which was shared by all of them was above D rank. This would naturally give Ye Feng a bit of a hard time. Even so, Ye Feng confirmed one thing to Si Shun that things like this were just delicious food for him. When Ye Feng, who wanted to take an unexpected step, Shun even sacrificed himself to fight against Shi Shi. He also ordered Ye Feng to immediately save Miss Bai Yi and protect her. Shun even now managed to fight with one of the specters so that it became very fierce. Ye Feng is now starting to enter the battle arena, which makes Shun now have to face his nemesis, Shi Shi. The fight between the two of them is now getting wilder and more tense because these two people are very difficult to reconcile. Not far from the location of the battle, there were also five spectators who intended to kill Ye Feng. Attacks started to be carried out by the five specters simultaneously which made Ye Feng immediately release a demon spirit, which was a lion demon. With its roar, the Lion King managed to paralyze these specters making them feel a state that was truly impossible. How could they get hurt just by a roar from a lion like this? They didn't want to stop there. They started to put up a fight and tried again to attack simultaneously. The attack itself was now successfully avoided by Ye Feng by using a vicious circle technique so that anyone who got close was now immediately sprawled out. After the five specters collapsed, Ye Feng realized that this opponent was extremely weak. Besides that, it was shown by the fierce battle between Shun and Shi Shi. Shi Shi was a little amazed by the greatness obtained by Shun who came from the ghost sect. Before the big fight was about to happen again, Shun tried to ask Shi Shi about the reason why Shi Shi and the others tried to finish him off, and what exactly they all planned. Shun would threaten Shi Shi if Shi Shi didn't want to open her mouth then she would open Shi Shi's mouth using her own hands. At a time like this Shi Shi explained that this was not the time to say such things. However Shi Shi said that currently the two elders of Shun's ghost sect were not here, so Shi Shi could take advantage of this situation. But on the other hand, it can be seen that Ye Feng has defeated five specters with a landslide, so that in the end, Shi Shi will immediately bring out his best ability to avenge everything. Shi Shi's best ability actually succeeded in resurrecting the five specters that were previously defeated. This kind of power made Shun and Ye Feng a little worried. They will use their abilities to the best of their ability. Shun is now unsparingly willing to sacrifice his own life to protect Master Ye Feng. Shun did all of this because he felt very much indebted to Budi to Ye Feng, who had educated him as a demon who was strong enough. Shun is now with all his heart pouring out everything for Ye Feng who is quite difficult with this situation, and he has little time to save Shun. Shun now has to face one of the spectators, which in the end makes Shun quite overwhelmed. Luckily at that time, Ye Feng helped Shun so one specter had now perished. When it managed to defeat one specter unexpectedly, Two other specters tried to attack Ye Feng so, again and again, Shun sacrificed himself. The direct attack that was aimed at Ye Feng earlier now hit Shun instead. Ye Feng was too late for that, and not only that, Ye Feng was also stabbed in the back by Shi Shi at this time. With that wound, Ye Feng would immediately retaliate very cruelly. A battle began to occur between Ye Feng and Shi Shi. Unmitigated because of that anger, Ye Feng was forced to use the demon killer technique Blood Fury which in fact could make Shi Shi not do the same very. Shi Shi tried to avoid the blood attack, but everything was too slow because the blood attack was really like a hunter. They would target the enemy very, very tightly, which in the end made Shi Shi also be restrained by the blood technique and defeated by Ye's demonic technique Feng, so that the other specters also perished. With this whole situation, Ye Feng, without thinking twice, immediately saved Shun who was seriously injured, then immediately took Shun to the car to be healed. Ye Feng also explained one thing to Bai Yi that the woman Shi Shi's condition earlier had now undergone a soul-dissolving process where Shi Shi would forever become a blood slave. These were all the consequences for daring to harm Ye Feng's people. For all the atrocities witnessed by Bai Yi, Bai Yi finally realized with all her heart that this Ye Feng figure really came out of hell because he was never afraid of the enemies in front of him. After that, Ye Feng, without any other choice, 
would immediately carry out high-level treatment for Shun, namely by injecting his energy. Ye Feng rushed to put his energy into Shun's body. Bai Yi, who was outside now, tried to look at the ball up close. But when she got closer, it turned out that the ball contained two very suspicious figures. The soul of the figure was now trying to find the whereabouts of Ye Feng. But when they were about to do that, suddenly, suddenly, Ye Feng's previous blood slave, Shi Shi, managed to perform a protective technique. Shi Shi used the blood ability technique that Ye Feng had earlier to defeat the two mysterious figures. With all his might, Shi Shi tried to deal with the two mysterious figures, but attacks from Shi Shi did not mean anything. Shi Shi died instantly, and this also made Shi Shi finally free from blood slaves. Under these circumstances, Ye Feng was quite emotional because he felt disturbed. Ye Feng was now starting to show himself and would soon fight against this mysterious figure who was known as the two strongest people from the Ghost Clan who had betrayed him. Before the fight was shown with Shun, who was currently recovering due to getting an energy injection from Ye Feng earlier. At this time, Ye Feng was really angry and was about to teach the twins a lesson soon. It didn't take long for Ye Feng to now control the two twins completely, so that these two people became blood slaves of Ye Feng. After finishing this, Ye Feng rushed to that place along with the others. In a different place, you can see a man named Lin Hao Yuan, who is the deputy minister of the Wang He of the Leaf of Jiangdong province. He is currently meeting his grandfather, where his grandfather also told the man to always look after Bai Yi, because Bai Yi really needs care. He then immediately told Grandpa that if he would always protect Bai Yi, he was sure he could protect him to the best of his ability. When they were talking like that just now, a strange situation came to that place where there was a strong man who immediately met Hao Yuan and also the grandfather. It turned out that this man was none other than the figure of the fourth son of the Leng family. He was part of the, the Leng family. It turned out that the man was looking for the whereabouts of Ye Feng because he wanted to avenge the death of Gong Yong Fei. The man also emphasized one thing to Hao Yuan that this was his family's business, so Wang He had better not get involved in this matter if he still wanted to live in peace. In this place, the grandfather tried to oppose the man because the man had destroyed the gate, and this was quite excessive. The man immediately tried to attack the grandfather, but was overcome by Hao Yuan. Hao Yuan said that this was absolutely not allowed to do, and if he dared to do it, he would will face him. Under these circumstances, the man still did not remain silent. He said this was all too much done by the organization. At that place, the fourth son said to Chairman Bai, He can't continue this because there is Hao Yuan's deputy in this place. The troubles between them would never end if Bai Yi's family did not put Ye Feng into his hands. Getting a threat like that didn't make the grandfather careless and afraid just like that. He dared to swear to himself if Ye Feng is his life savior and until whenever he will always protect Ye Feng and also he will never let him go alone. These words from grandfather made the fourth son even hotter, he said. It's really good this time. Is this what you want? And I can give it three days. And if Ye Feng doesn't come to see him within three days, then the Bai family will soon be gone from earth. Then back to Ye Feng and the others. There Ye Feng told Bai Yi that currently there are lots of enemies targeting the Bai family. Bai Yi was very surprised about that because he felt really threatened too. He added that currently the family on Bai Yi's side had never paid any attention to it so the other families would never care about the Ye family. They would currently focus on hunting down the Bai family because that family was Ye Feng's only connection. Bai Yi was also very worried about this. He tried to contact his grandfather to tell his grandfather about everything that happened but then Shun said that at this time, grandfather was brave and willing to always be by Ye Feng's side. He would never leave Ye Feng feeling a debt of gratitude. With all these circumstances, Bai Yi could only accept it, and then Ye Feng thought of a very mature plan that he should do with the poison wolf. These two women were forced to go home first because Ye Feng would take care of it. Sometime later, Poison Wolf came to a hotel to go to a presidential suite. The purpose of going there was to meet someone, and it was Luo Chun. Here the maid said that the room had already been booked, but with their manipulation technique, Ye Feng managed to get the maid to allow them to enter there. It didn't take long for Ye Feng to get the key and barged into the room. Luo Chun was very surprised at Ye Feng's arrival, but he couldn't do much. Without thinking, Ye Feng immediately killed Luo Chun very cruelly. And when Ye Feng managed to finish him off, he didn't forget that Ye Feng also used his forbidden technique. 
namely making this man his blood slave. Ye Feng used it to meet a man named Hua Qing. Hua Qing really didn't know what was going on, as if he was being stabbed by such intense pressure that he was unable to speak a single word. It was at this time that Ye Feng showed himself and introduced himself to that Hua Qing. He also told Hua Qing something he wanted to do. Here Ye Feng began to emphasize one thing where Ye Feng said that currently there were only two choices that Hua Qing could take. The first is to swear by his blood to become a servant, or the second is to become a puppet of a blood slave like Luo Chen. Hua Qing really didn't know what to say. She ultimately chose to swear to be her servant for Ye Feng to forgive her. He did this for the sake of survival. Under these conditions, it turned out that Hua Qing had prepared an escape seal himself, and in the end, he managed to escape from that place. He was now trying to escape with all his might, and in this condition he finally realized that Ye Feng was very dangerous. He would immediately warn the fourth son about this power from Ye Feng. Ye Feng himself was very happy with Hua Qing's escape, because with that escape, Ye Feng would soon get the whereabouts of the fourth son because surely Hua Qing would go straight to the fourth son. Ye Feng, who was still dissatisfied with this situation, he ordered the blood slave to immediately attack Hua Qing and follow him. But it's a pity that when a big battle took place in that place, Hua Qing also easily destroyed the blood with the death technique he had. Even so, Ye Feng would immediately want to know where his clan's hideout was. Sometime later, Hua Qing also managed to meet the fourth son. There he apologized for what happened, but unfortunately the fourth son did not want to forgive him. He was really disappointed in Hua Qing because even though he was given so much power, Hua Qing instead became a loser who was willing to run away and not finish off Ye Feng. For that disappointment made Hua Qing now be attacked with a heavy blow by the fourth son. He didn't want any loser to dare to run away just to save himself. Hua Qing was truly suffering like a trash. He was also told to leave this room immediately, and if Hua Qing couldn't deal with Ye Feng, then the fourth son would not want to see his face again, and it became a symbol of danger to Hua Qing. In such a miserable state, it was unexpected that Hua Qing could stand firm, but his eyes were currently bloodshot. It was all Ye Feng's actions that managed to control Hua Qing. That realization made the fourth son know that it was Ye Feng. He carried out a heavy attack that sent Hua Qing flying far down. It could be said that before that Hua Qing had been hit by a poison blood technique that belonged to Ye Feng, so Ye Feng easily controlled himself at this time. The attack that Hua Qing took earlier made the true form of the darkness that had possessed Hua Qing's body earlier now become clear in the eyes of the fourth son. The fourth son was completely amazed at Ye Feng's strength, because even though he was quite far away, Ye Feng was still able to control Hua Qing. Even so, the fourth son, without a second thought, instantly finished off the spirit figure. Time passed, and amidst the chaos, Ye Feng realized that this fourth son would be quite difficult to beat, as he had many very interesting ideas. Not long after, the poison wolf came straight to Ye Feng to say one thing. At this time, everyone who had connected with Ye Feng had been successfully protected. Poison wolf asked for a next plan. But Ye Feng first told Poison Wolf to enjoy the wine that had been prepared, while on the other hand, Fatty is shown, who is currently able to get a lot of subordinates because he is the figure of the owner of the Red Diamond nightclub that was previously stolen by Ye Feng. Fatty is now a boss who is very, very lucky, in a state full of fun like that. Suddenly they were surprised by the arrival of a man wearing a hat who had previously met Poison Wolf in the battle arena. Here the man said one thing where he wanted to meet Ye Feng. This man was invited to enter, and when the meeting took place between Ye Feng and him, it turned out that the man called Ye Feng as master. There the man immediately sent several files sent by the elders of the clan to Ye Feng. This is an important information about a planning that will happen soon. Under these circumstances Ye Feng asked the man which side you belong to. The man in the hat named Zhao immediately confirmed one thing. If he is 100% not from the Lang family, he can't choose anyone at this time either. It was on this basis that Ye Feng ordered Poison Wolf to immediately escort this Mr. Zhao home. In another location shown with an odd thing done by the fourth son, he tries to help a girl named Chan. Qian is Ye Feng's childhood friend who Ye Feng really wants to protect. At a time like this, Chan, who had a problem because her mother needed a lot of money to carry out the operation, 
forced her to ask the fourth son for help to pay off all the payments. She was also willing to do whatever the fourth son wanted. Qian did all this because he really loved his mother. He was willing to owe his life to this fourth son. The fourth son could only smile and accept the offer. In his heart, Qian also said one thing, where he apologized to Ye Feng because so far he had not told Ye Feng anything. Meanwhile, Ye Feng is now focusing on his plan. He orders a slave of his blood to keep following Mr. Zhao's figure, because he wants to know some important and interesting information from Zhao, who has now passed away from Ye Feng's place. On the way, he told his clan members that at this time Ye Feng was a truly formidable figure. He could even predict that no one would be able to compete with that figure of Ye Feng. In that conversation they also discussed the special plan of the fourth son, which is now likely to be leaked. Zhao then emphasized one thing that it was likely that the fourth son would also never survive against that Ye Feng. This whole situation made Poison Wolf quite worried because he felt that Ye Feng was too trusting of the people from the Wang He organization. But Ye Feng emphasized one thing, that this was done with his brains. Emphasized that if the current Wang He of the Leaf wanted to use them as test subjects, then they should also be able to benefit from the cooperation. No half-hearted. How long later Ye Feng finally got news of certainty from members of the organization about the plan of the Fourth Sun, where the plan was the plan to kidnap Qian. This kind of information made Ye Feng rush to order the Poison Wolf to protect Qian immediately. He said that if Qian was even slightly injured, there would be no excuse for the Poison Wolf to come back here. Poison Wolf was eager to carry out this mission, and then said in his heart that the figure of the fourth son was a loser who dared to use someone as a tool for revenge. The Poison Wolf will finish off the fourth son so viciously if he dares to hurt Qian just like that. Qian himself is shown reuniting with the fourth son, and the fourth son begins to prepare all the money needed for his mother's surgery. At this time, the poison wolf managed to meet the figure of the fourth son. There he tried to prevent the fourth son from taking Qian away. The fourth son then said that a figure like this poison wolf was nothing compared to him. He also ordered the poison wolf to leave this place immediately if he wanted to be safe. But the poison wolf then said that Miss Qian was someone Master Ye Feng protected so he didn't would never let Qian be taken away by a villain like this fourth son. When the middle poison wolf spoke like that, a heavy attack was now coming towards him. Because the fourth son was now getting angrier, the attack made the poison wolf realize that this person was too strong for him, but he had to be able to save Qian. The poison wolf tried to counterattack, but again and again he received such heavy blows to the face that he too was now battered by the fourth son. The fourth son was about to carry out the finish line with a high-level technique, but Qian accidentally ordered him to stop doing it because the poison wolf had nothing to do with him. Qian also then explained why he didn't ask Ye Feng for help with this hospital fee. Qian did all this because he realized all this time he had interfered and interfered with Ye Feng's life. Moreover, Qian also knew about Ye Feng's economy, which was quite difficult at the moment. It could be said that up to now, Qian still recognized Ye Feng as the weak young man he had recognized since childhood. Qian immediately ordered the fourth son to immediately take him away from there because he was the main reason behind all of this. Before leaving that place, fourth son also assured Poison Wolf one thing, that at this time Poison Wolf's life can still be saved. And this is all thanks to Qian. After that, Qian also asked the fourth son about the bill in his mother's operation. The fourth son then said that if all of that had been successfully arranged, and his current goal was just to take Qian away. In this condition, Qian also convinced the fourth son of one thing, that if later the fourth son wanted to do all this to harm Ye Feng, then he would kill himself. Then he saw Ye Feng, who was currently recovering. At that moment he realized that the replica of his blood slave was finished, and he didn't need to take back his energy for now. He also realized that the fourth son of the Lung family was hard to deal with. Not long after Ye Feng got a call from his men about Qian's whereabouts, at this time Ye Feng, who heard news like that, made himself really angry and was about to finish off the figure of the fourth son. He rushed to his destination, and shortly after then, a meeting ensued between the fourth son and Ye Feng, which revealed that it was the day of death for the fourth son. Ye Feng started to carry out forbidden attacks towards the fourth son, but his attacks suddenly stopped when he saw with his own eyes that Qian's figure was now lying in a place. 
Qian was completely helpless, and at this time wearing a wedding dress, it turned out that the fourth son wanted to marry Qian's figure. In that place not only was Qian the hostage, but there was Lin, and also the poison wolf. This fourth son is really cunning. He does everything he can to win the battle. He also realizes that Zhao the man in the hat also betrayed him and took half of his plan. But without Zhao realizing the many surprises that the fourth son wanted to do to Ye Feng. The fourth son is now really arrogant. He even said that at this time Ye Feng had no one on his side except for Bai Yi and the Bai family. But right now it was all in vain because the Bai family had been blocked by the troops sent by the fourth son. It was impossible for the Bai family to be able to help Ye Feng here. Ye Feng, who heard that, obviously didn't care because this kind of deed was obviously very, very low compared to what he did in his old demon planet. Ye Feng began to provide a resistance with such a high technique, full of emotion, he immediately issued a direct attack right at the fourth son. But the fourth son managed to block the attack with the sword he owned. At this time, the fourth son emphasized one thing in his mind. Ye Feng could only watch and could not attack, because if Ye Feng took a heavy attack, then this whole ship would sink, and all would go to hell with him. Ye Feng didn't care about it either. He immediately used the Demonic's War technique, which then gave the fourth son quite a hard time. The fourth son also directed his men to counterattack. But one by one the men were now defeated by Ye Feng, thought of the men as little mosquitoes who dared to bother him. When Ye Feng exterminated the fourth son's subordinates, Ye Feng also asked the fourth son one thing about whether this fourth son didn't care about the figure of his subordinates. The fourth son who heard that then immediately confirmed if he really didn't care for his subordinates because all his subordinates are here only for the money. Ye Feng also felt that this man's figure was not much different from himself, who was a devil. The fourth son who heard that then immediately emphasized that he really doesn't care about his subordinates because all of his subordinates are here only for money. Ye Feng also felt that this man's figure was not much different from himself, who was a devil. The fourth son who heard that then immediately emphasized that he really doesn't care about his subordinates because all of his subordinates are here only for money. Ye Feng also felt that this man's figure was not much different from himself, who was a devil. Under these circumstances, Ye Feng immediately took out the demonic slaying technique of the demon child where it was seen that a small, reddish-colored boy was about to attack. Ye Feng's technique was tried to be anticipated by the subordinates of the fourth son, but it was too terrifying. That little boy was so ferocious that even slowly the men of this fourth son were finished off by the figure of that little boy. In this condition, Ye Feng also said to the fourth son, Come and be my food. Now Ye Feng has succeeded in defeating one hundred soldiers of the fourth son by using the lion and also the red little boy. Under these circumstances, even the fourth son realized that Ye Feng was a truly powerful figure. He was even surprised that Ye Feng could still survive under the attack of his one hundred soldiers. The fourth son also realized that at this time Ye Feng's ability was close to S level. But this kind of level was still below his own so he was the only true master with abilities above S level. Then the white mist attack was immediately issued by the figure of the fourth son, thus making even Ye Feng really feel challenged by this. He wanted to find out how long the fourth son would be able to defend against his attacks. The combination of the two attacks had now become extremely fierce and unmitigated. This made Ye Feng really realize that the strength he released earlier was still not enough at all. Even now, the white mist managed to go so fast and almost made Ye Feng hurt. This situation made Ye Feng also have an idea. He ordered the little boy to eat the lion to increase his strength. In this condition, the fourth son was even more arrogant. He said if Ye Feng was only an ant in his eyes. Let's see if you can survive my attack, said the fourth son. Then without thinking long, the fourth son immediately issued a thousand sharp mist technique that made Ye Feng now start to worry and then immediately tried to defend himself. When he was about to counterattack unexpectedly, the red boy was now ready to carry out the mission. The red boy now carries a very terrible scythe weapon. To counterattack he did a combo with Ye Feng so that the fourth son was now quite overwhelmed. Even so, the fourth son didn't attack just like that. He released a mist of havoc, but his attack was even more dominated by Ye Feng, who now released a blood technique that was truly deadly, which made the fourth son even more cornered. 
The fourth son is now hit right in the chest in this condition, saying to the fourth son, if the fourth son is a strong figure, but the fourth son will still die today. The fourth son who heard that then also immediately emphasized that at this time, Ye Feng was the first very strong person he had ever met. This naturally made him even more interested in continuing the battle. The fourth son took out a fiery fog of havoc technique, but again Ye Feng didn't want to let it go, he counterattacked. Under these circumstances, the fourth son was arrogant again, and Ye Feng also felt an interest in this fight, as the fourth son was tough enough to be an enemy. After that, they immediately carried out a close combat. They used special techniques to carry out attacks. The fourth son tried to attack, but his attack was still too weak, so his attack was managed to be broken by Ye Feng, who was now directly hitting the fourth son. In this condition, Ye Feng returned to a heavy attack, so that now it destroyed the pillar there and freed Lin from the trap. Lin had now managed to survive the curse placed on him by the fourth son, and in this condition the fourth son took advantage of the situation until he managed to injure Ye Feng's rear body. But even so, Ye Feng confirmed one thing to Lin that Lin was required to immediately save Qian and the others. Lin rushed to carry out the order while Ye Feng was about to end his fight with the fourth son. Under such circumstances it was obvious that the fourth son would not just let it go, he would finish off the entire person altogether. Ye Feng, who knew that, rushed to do self-protection. When Lin tried to take Qian away from there, Ye Feng also protected with all his might from the attack of the fog created by the fourth son. Now Ye Feng started a close combat because Ye Feng realized that this fourth son was quite weak in close combat. Attacks began to be carried out by Ye Feng, but again and again, Ye Feng will now find it increasingly difficult because unexpectedly, the fourth son managed to carry out a technique with the highest curse, so that without realizing it made Ye Feng now cry blood. Ye Feng looked as if he was suffering from such an attack, but he clearly didn't give up easily. Ye Feng, who felt himself being humiliated like that, became angry and immediately attacked the fourth son's face, causing the fourth son to be knocked back. Ye Feng continued to carry out one-on-one -on -one attacks, but those attacks were repelled as best he could by the fourth son. But this fourth son was getting more and more desperate. He immediately used concrete to attack Ye Feng. But the concrete was easily crushed and crushed just like that. Being in this kind of condition made the fourth son wonder, how could Ye Feng become so strong in such a short amount of time? Ye Feng then explained one thing, that this could happen because he managed to absorb the power aura released by the fourth son. The fourth son really couldn't think of such a technique as it would be detrimental to him. Ye Feng then said goodbye to the figure of the fourth son, while also saying that if the fourth son was the last step for him to reach the S level, at this time the fourth son was also ruthlessly killed by a self-splitting technique. Ye Feng is now back to meet Lin, and also says that if everything is over, and they can go home in peace. The next day, Ye Feng and the others were now at the Bai Yi family's residence, where various treatments were received by Bai Yi and the others, they were all completely cured and treated very well by the Bai family. At that place, they were all worried that there was a possibility that Ye Feng would continue to be chased by the Lung family. But Shun then emphasized one thing, that in the central government the Ye family was a family that might be at the top tiers, and it would be increasingly difficult for other families to touch him, especially now. The fourth son who was famous for his prowess had been subdued by Ye Feng. At times like that, the grandfather also suggested to Ye Feng to stay in this city. But Ye Feng had another plan he had to do. Meanwhile, in a different place, it is shown that Hao Yuan is currently meeting with the figure of Gong Yunfei's mother. There, Madame Leng alias Gong Yunfei's mother asks for security from the Wang He of the Leaf Organization, because according to her, only this organization can save her from being murdered. Carried out by Ye Feng, for that safety later, he was also able to do a very unexpected thing, where he would hand over 90% of his wealth to that organization, including Hao Yuan. Of course, the chief Wang He of the Leaf agreed without thinking. As you know, Hao Yuan is part of Grandpa, and also part of Bai Yi's family. He was also a top official of an organization where their goal was still the same, namely to immediately carry out research subjects on Ye Feng's body. In such a tense situation, Madame Lung instead ordered Hao Yuan to finish off Ye Feng, and he would give the rest of all his wealth to Hao Yuan. Hao Yuan also clearly refused because at this time Ye Feng's safety would be very calculated. 
because Ye Feng's body would be used as a research subject. Sometime later, Hao Yuan saw who was currently having a special conversation with Miss Bai Yi. During the conversation, Hao Yuan asked Bai Yi about the developments regarding Ye Feng. Is there any other important information? Bai Yi then then said that at this time there was no important information at all. There was only a business progress carried out by Ye Feng, who was currently managing the assets he had stolen from the Gong family and Lang family. After that, they will also have a conversation that is completely private, so they are forced to enter a room, where Hao Yuan will explain who Ye Feng is. When he got inside, Hao Yuan immediately said that Ye Feng's figure was so scary. Meanwhile, Di the next day was shown again with Ye Feng, who was currently with Shun. Shun is currently ordered by Ye Feng to find out about all kinds of information about Qian. Is there anything hidden by her figure that is very similar to Huang, the lover of Ye Feng who is in hell? Shun continues to search, but until now he has not received any information regarding Qian. But soon Ye Feng suddenly got a message where the message was intended for Ye Feng, where Ye Feng was required to tell about the secrets of our mystical star Gong Fa. It turned out that this all came from the Wang He group, where they wanted to know the ins and outs of Ye Feng. In the evening before doing that, Ye Feng again had a special meeting with Qian. There was Shun, who would always be his bodyguard. They managed to meet again with Bai Yi. There they would soon be having a special conversation so they went into a room to discuss it. When he managed to get inside, at that place it was also Hao Yuan who then told him to calm down and sit down first. Ye Feng has now managed to recognize Hao Yuan's figure, and there he often says, if he will immediately tell a part about the mystical star Gong Fa. But before that, Hao Yuan also has to be able to answer various questions raised by Ye Feng. Hao Yuan then said, if he would answer that question, if he knew the answer. That way, Ye Feng immediately asked one question, whether this Qian figure was a transmigrator. In this condition, Hao Yuan could only remain silent, and he said, if this Ye Feng knows about the intricacies of the world, Hao Yuan planned to quickly explain it. But here Hao Yuan could not say more, because Qian was one of the special figures run by the Wang He organization, so to achieve that he had to become the leader figure in the Ye family. Knowing that Ye Feng then asked Hao Yuan, what if he killed his entire family and became the top list in his family? Hearing Ye Feng's statement made Hao Yuan only be able to say that it was possible. Not long after the conversation was over, and now Hao Yuan is planning to tell everything to Grandpa there. With Ye Feng's request, they were able to understand that Ye Feng was someone who was truly ambitious, and even willing to wipe out the entire Ye family. The Ye family itself was a family that consisted of the top ranks in this place, because all businesses and jobs were averaged over by the Ye family. So if Ye Feng could become the first top of the Ye family, it could increase his range of qualities. Meanwhile now Ye Feng can only say in his heart about Qian's figure, where he can only feel if this Qian doesn't completely become Huang. There are some who may live inside Qian, but at least Huang can't possibly come back to life because Huang's soul has long been dead and can never be whole. Even so, Ye Feng will continue to seek all information about Qian. Not long after, the Poison Wolf arrived, who immediately informed Ye Feng about something where he was often rumored about the whereabouts of the center of the Deviant Organization. The association knew about it, Ye Feng would immediately head there, and before that the poison wolf had to escort this Qian figure to safety. A while later Ye Feng as well as Shun had successfully arrived at the place, they gave their invitation code so they could enter here. Ye Feng's purpose in doing so was because Ye Feng wanted to find out about the ins and outs of the Wang He of the Leaf Organization, and the others split up in that place. Shun was walking alone and he instead met Bai Yi's figure. A special conversation then took place between the two of them where in silence they discussed Qian. In such circumstances, Ye Feng listened to a conversation between them which had discussed the figure of Chang, where Qian's current existence was in danger because currently Qian's soul had not been fully fulfilled. Shun is required to find his remaining soul as soon as possible. This can be said if Qian is a transmigrator. Under these conditions, Shun was really confused about the situation that was happening. But even so, Bai Yi gave him a tool that could certainly help Shun in his search. It was called Soul Compensation Incense, which would be of great use to help Qian. All this news was known by Ye Feng. Then Ye Feng also realized one thing where at this time, the position of one of his souls was already in a place where gold and coins were stored. 
There, he managed to use his ability to disguise himself as a man in a hat. He then immediately destroyed the barrier wall that separated the coins in that place. And Ye Feng was now able to successfully use the Haotian domain, where with such an ability, he managed to destroy the warehouse easily and find various very attractive prizes. There were lots of treasures. Wealth whose amount could even reach the entire planet. With this discovery, Ye Feng finally realized that there is still much in this world that he still doesn't know. However, soon he realized that a man was coming. Sure enough, the man immediately made Zhao not move. Ye Feng's shadow was then immediately destroyed by the man, causing Ye Feng to be affected by his attack. This man also had such a frightening aura, he could even tell that this Ye Feng was from a blood energy cultivation. He was currently so arrogant that he said, if he was only going to deal one punch, because right now he didn't want to fight in this condition, making Ye Feng also realize that the man's figure was way above his strength level. Ye Feng really didn't expect that in a place like this, there would be a monster as terrifying as that man's figure. Ye Feng would then immediately use his blood slave to immediately anticipate the man's figure. Ye Feng began to make his own appointment there. The man was still very arrogant. He told Ye Feng that at this time he only wanted to take a few punches and did not want finish off Ye Feng. He just wanted to teach Ye Feng a lesson. This man came from the Haoshin sect, who was famous for his prowess. The man also realized that currently Ye Feng was a figure from the mystical star. Even so, the man was about to launch an attack on Ye Feng. When the man was about to strike, Ye Feng without a second thought immediately took out his main technique. At first the man thought that he could block and anticipate the attack, but when he felt close to that power, he finally realized that this power could not be damned. In this condition, Ye Feng also said that the Haotian sect was a trash sect, before which had been abolished by Ye Feng because it was famous for its cruelty and tyranny. The man is now really frustrated. He did not expect that the power possessed by Ye Feng would be this big. The attack carried out by Ye Feng now caused the man to experience very deep wounds. In this condition, he also didn't realize what was happening. Ye Feng was truly a demon of hell, who had no conscience and was very ruthless in carrying out the end in this kind of situation. Because the man realized Ye Feng's great ability, he planned to become Ye Feng's subordinate, but Ye Feng said that it was too late. The man was now finished off by Ye Feng, and in this situation made Ye Feng who realized that the man earlier was only big in his speech while his strength was very, very minimal. It could be said that the man in the past only won in bluffing. After that, Ye Feng immediately headed to a warehouse whose contents were the gifts waiting there. He accidentally found something he was looking for, namely, soul gathering. This is a place to collect the souls of people who have been lost. In this state, Ye Feng was really happy. But soon the man was still alive and was now attacking Ye Feng with a high level of strength. The man was now standing firm while saying that at this time it was Ye Feng's turn to die because earlier Ye Feng had beaten him brutally. Even though at this time he often received heavy attacks, Ye Feng said that this man must be taken action immediately. Ye Feng initially offered the option of being able to escape from here, but the man was completely emotional and directly attacked Ye Feng with his utmost ability. This man was really very emotional, and his attack made him quite worried, but Ye Feng managed to beat him in close combat. Not long after that, Ye Feng also now brought in his two twins where these twins were blood slaves that he had previously managed to get. In conditions like this, made the man really scared because the figures of the two twins were the conquerors of heaven, and it could erase various evils that belonged to a person including the evil that belonged to this man. The man was now caught by the twins, so there was no way for him to escape again. In this condition, Ye Feng confirmed that this was a sign of his death. Ye Feng immediately released a technique commonly called the Heaven Conquering Ghost, which then immediately absorbed all of this man's energy. Now the man was really in a very helpless state. All his energy was now being absorbed by Ye Feng, and soon, he would soon get death. The twins immediately finished off the man's figure so that they would go to hell. After doing that, Ye Feng also realized that in this place, there were still a lot of secrets, especially regarding soul storage devices. He would immediately find out more detailed information. After carrying out many of his duties, Ye Feng is now going home soon. In the car there are Shun, Bai Yi, and also Ye Feng. 
They set off at high speed, but when they were traveling suddenly they were confronted by a large creature whose shape was like a flying lion resembling a gargoyle. The monster is now very brave to attack Ye Feng, but Ye Feng doesn't let it. When the monster tries to attack, Ye Feng immediately attacks the monster first right in the face so that the monster can't get up anymore. Ye Feng then felt that this was all over, but soon the monster was able to get back up and was now flying in the air. The monster was now preparing for a big attack so that Ye Feng would fight alone, while the others are placed in a safe place. Ye Feng then almost got hit by a heavy blow from the monster. Luckily, he was still able to avoid it. Ye Feng managed to avoid it, then immediately gave a counterattack right into the monster's body area, so that the direct attack now made the monster completely subdued. In this condition suddenly the figure of the person who sent this monster also appeared, so that Ye Feng could only watch it. It turned out that the figure of the man who came to him was not a random person. He was none other than the head of the heavenly sect named Shi Ying Tian, and yesterday the figure of the man who was heavily attacked by Ye Feng was his disciple. Here he will avenge that, and will avenge Ye Feng for having succeeded in stealing various attractive prizes at the association's place, as well as for killing his student. Under these circumstances, he would never let Ye Feng get away with it. Ye Feng could only smile at that state, and he wanted to quickly find out just how much strength this Shi Ying Tian possessed. Not long after a monster appeared that was still there, and Ye Feng was beaten by the monster, but this time, Ye Feng managed to figure out the trick. When Ye Feng found out about the trick, it turned out that again and again there was a monster figure behind him. This meant that Shi Ying Tian had a lot of pet monsters. In a place not far from there, Shun and Bai Yi could only worry about Ye Feng's situation, but they had to stay quiet in that place so as not to provoke enemies. Meanwhile, Ye Feng was currently being beaten by the monster's figure to the point where Ye Feng couldn't get up anymore. In conditions like this, it turns out that Ying Tian has a lot of monsters, which monsters also have enormous abilities. Ye Feng, who is now being squeezed, immediately released his abilities so that he managed to escape from the monster's reach. But when he managed to escape, it turned out that there were not only two monsters that came, there were more and more monsters, and Ye Feng was getting beaten badly because he was caught by the monster again and got an attack full of suffering. It turned out that Shi Ying Tian at this time had managed to use the pentacle formation technique in which there were many lion monsters with large bodies, and the monsters immediately attacked Ye Feng's area so that Ye Feng was now being hit by such a sadistic attack. This situation caused Ye Feng to scream in pain very loudly, and then he gave off a thick demonic aura. When Yin Tian realized Ye Feng's true form, he immediately quickened his pace and now managed to arrive in front of Ye Feng. Sure Ying Tian received a heavy blow from Ye Feng and Ying Tian, who was now feeling pressured trying to protect himself with the pets he had, but it turned out that one by one, the pets had been finished off by Ye Feng. The more often the pet gets closer, they will destroy it with deadly blows. When Ye Feng managed to defeat the pets, it turned out that the injuries suffered by the pets were also felt by Ying Tian, which meant that he was connected to the pets he had. This situation made Ye Feng even more happy, because defeating the pets could make Ying Tian's body even weaker. Under these circumstances, Ying Tian said, How could this Ye Feng, who was only an S rank, have such a powerful ability. This is certainly a much greater ability than just an S ability. Ye Feng could only say, if he wasn't that special, he would only prey on people. The people he met who tried to get in his way. The man was now completely terrified of Ye Feng's figure and immediately gave a pointed attack towards the man. The man tried to contain it with the few pets he still had, but they were again annihilated by Ye Feng. The man was now completely terrified of Ye Feng's figure and immediately gave a pointed attack towards the man. The man tried to contain it with the few pets he still had, but they were again annihilated by Ye Feng. The man was now completely terrified of Ye Feng's figure, and immediately gave a pointed attack towards the man. The man tried to contain it with the few pets he still had, but they were again annihilated by Ye Feng. When the pets had gotten used to it, Ye Feng didn't think twice, and immediately put out his best ability, and immediately attacked his chest, so that now Shi Ying Tian was immediately knocked to the floor. Ye Feng will soon end this game and will finish off Ying Tian. But not long after, Grandma's figure arrives, and she is now approaching the battle arena. 
In this condition, Ye Feng was trying to find out who exactly that figure was. The figure turned out to be Ying Tian's teacher who was trying to ask his teacher for help. But the teacher immediately said that Ying Tian needed to be silent for now. In this condition made Ye Feng realize that this grandma figure had such a terrifying aura, but behind it all she was very focused on self-defense. He could even make it seem as though he was weak. Grandma's purpose in coming here wasn't to mess around. She apologized to Ye Feng because what happened was out of her control. Grandma now, without thinking twice, immediately invited Ye Feng to join the alliance. He did that because all of this was based on natural laws where only the strongest could survive. So with Ye Feng's strength it would at least help the organization to provide protection. Grandma also explained that previously she had let go about the theft committed by Ye Feng, and also about the man who killed Ye Feng because the man was actually only tested by the organization to assess whether it was worth joining the organization or not. Under these circumstances, the grandma kept asking Ye Feng to join. She tried to ask Ye Feng if Ye Feng wanted to join the alliance. Ye Feng, who got such an opportunity, then immediately said if he would think about it first, and therefore grandma said, see you at the next meeting. Not long after, Ye Feng got a phone call made by his men. His men said that at this time, there was something strange about Qian's soul, and he was required to come to him immediately. Ye Feng rushed over to the place. And after he left, there was a special conversation between Ying Tian and Grandma. They both realized that this Ye Feng actually refused to join the alliance, but even so, the Grandma told Ying Tian that they should let Ye Feng do that. Ying Tian really didn't understand what was going on because previously he was sent to defeat Ye Feng, but now Ye Feng was allowed to go free. Not long after that a debate also occurred between the top officials of the organization, the grandma was aware of the figure of the old man who took advantage of all this. After that it was shown by Ye Feng, who at this time managed to meet the poison wolf, where there was also Qian. There Ye Feng also saw that Qian's condition was getting worse, and this didn't last long. In this condition, Ye Feng also realized that Qian's soul was getting weaker. So from that, he immediately used the tool that Bai Yi gave to Shun yesterday. The tool felt capable of restoring his soul, and he immediately put it on Qian. And in this condition, Ye Feng also uses an item which is a soul collection item. By combining these tools, soon Qian was feeling better, the recovery system seemed to be doing its job very well. In such a state, Shun also came and, not long after that, Ye Feng fell a little bit because he had lost a lot of energy due to treating Qian. Now Qian's body is back to normal, and he is much better than before. Even so, Ye Feng also realized that Qian's soul had not fully recovered. He had to immediately look for a soul upgrade where this item was very rare. That item was commonly known as the soul soothing needle, and he had to urgently look for its whereabouts. Then Ye Feng also managed to come up with an idea where he would make the item himself, even though it took a lot of effort and money. Shun and Poison Wolf tried to help him, but he often said that right now he had enough funds coming from Fatty. But not long after, when Ye Feng tried to contact Fatty to ask a few things, a strange situation suddenly happened to Fatty. Fatty was now in pain and asked Ye Feng for help. It turned out that the figure that was intimidating Fatty was a green hat figure who was none other than Mr. Zhao, who at this time had completely become a different figure and immediately put Fatty in a slump. Fatty was now in pain and asked Ye Feng for help. It turned out that the figure that was intimidating Fatty was a green hat figure who was none other than Mr. Zhao who at this time had completely become a different figure and immediately put Fatty in a slump. Fatty was now in pain and asked Ye Feng for help. It turned out that the figure that was intimidating Fatty was a green hat figure who was none other than Mr. Zhao, who at this time had completely become a different figure and immediately put Fatty in a slump. At this time, Ye Feng was really worried about Fatty's condition. He rushed to the location where Fatty was being held captive. At this time, Ye Feng came with Poison Wolf, while Shun was now assigned by Ye Feng to always look after Qian's figure. In short, now Ye Feng and also the Poison Wolf managed to arrive at the location where Fatty was. There they found Fatty in good condition, but even so Ye Feng realized that something had happened to Fatty. Sure enough, not long after, a black aura came out of Fatty's body, as if Fatty was currently being hypnotized. To normalize it, Ye Feng immediately threw Poison Wolf to hit see Fatty's body, so that Fatty was now conscious again, 
while Ye Feng had to fight with the green figure. It turned out that Ye Feng knew that all this was a trap, and even so, there was something strange about Zhao, as if he was being controlled by someone. Ye Feng was aware of that, but he couldn't do much because right now Zhao was completely silent, like a statue turned into a toy. The fight started between the two sides. Zhao, with his green technique, directly attacked Ye Feng blindly. Ye Feng tried to anticipate that and brought out his devil mode here. Ye Feng also realized that the techniques used by Zhao seemed to reflect the figure of the perpetrator currently controlling Zhao's body. Again and again, Zhao failed to answer Ye Feng's questions, so Ye Feng was forced to use his abilities to beat Zhao. This battle was so terrible that the poison wolf immediately took Fatty to find a safe place. While in a different place, an unexpected situation occurred and was again in an unstable stage, causing Shun to completely freeze in that state. The grandfather came to see Shun, and the grandfather told Shun to hurry up and run away from this place and leave everything to grandfather, because grandfather would control everything that happened to him. The grandfather did this because, of course, all the hospitals in this area belonged to the Bai family. He was sure he could heal Qian's figure, who was in this condition. Grandfather also managed to persuade Shun, so that Shun now rushed away from there to help Ye Feng. Currently, a big battle is taking place between Ye Feng and Zhao, who really cannot underestimate this figure, because it provides quite a fierce resistance. Zhao then immediately gave a round of poison towards Ye Feng, so that it wasn't long before a heavy attack was now being received by Ye Feng. Ye Feng seemed to be trapped in a dimension that really, really didn't make sense. But luckily, again and again, Ye Feng managed to neutralize the technique, so that in such a state, it made the battle even more tense. This green killer technique was enough to give Ye Feng a hard time. He really felt that this was all very, very hard to deal with. Ye Feng immediately let out his dark aura in anticipation. The attacks Zhao had put out so far were quite intense, as he hadn't even been injured at all. He stood strong like someone who is really tough. When the fight broke out suddenly, Shun came to help Ye Feng, who was very worried about Shun's current whereabouts. Sure enough, not long after that Zhao was furious, he took out a poison technique from inside his mouth, so that in the end a big explosion occurred in that place, and Shun was now immediately sprawled. Ye Feng tried to take advantage of the situation by directly attacking Zhao, but unexpectedly, another heavy attack was thrown out by Zhao. Shun, who is now injured, tries to worry about Ye Feng's figure. Because at this time, Ye Feng is very, very weak compared to Zhao. Zhao even now made Ye Feng completely helpless. This old man then, without a second thought, directly ordered Zhao to immediately deal with Ye Feng and turn him to dust. Hearing those words, Zhao immediately made a destruction technique against the body, which was now getting weaker, and lay on the floor. The blue volcanic technique of sucking out poison was now immediately released by Zhao, so that the technique made Shun really scared. This Zhao was truly formidable. He was currently absolutely certain that Ye Feng had been eliminated. He tried to make another wish from the control figure, but it was over, and he was required to return. The next day, it was very difficult for Grandpa to contact Shun. Grandpa and Bai Yi were very worried about this condition, especially since Qian had yet to fully recover. In a state of confusion like that, suddenly the poison wolf immediately informed Grandfather that, at this time, there was a problem that had befallen Ye Feng. He immediately told the whole incident that he saw to Grandpa so that Grandpa really couldn't believe it. Meanwhile, in a different place, the old man who was observing from above was sure that with Ye Feng's death, many parties would suffer losses. A few moments later an association place that became a meeting of high-ranking officials, there we were shown Ye Feng who was still alive. How this happened was finally explained where exactly before the battle between Ye Feng and Zhao. At that time Zhao and Ye Feng had made a special plan for them to destroy the old man controlling him. But he couldn't do much because he was under the agreement that was made between the two of them. Where Ye Feng was required to give up the fight and pretend to die so that under these circumstances, Zhao could survive the old man's pursuit while also succeeding in deceiving him. That old man. The benefits that Ye Feng gets from this plan, Ye Feng will get various information he wants to know about the organization and about everything that is needed. So with all these circumstances, Ye Feng agrees, and finally, he pretends to surrender to the Zhao. In essence, what they were doing earlier was just a pretense, 
and Ye Feng continued to investigate the higher-up's building. There, he managed to climb onto the roof of the building to get back his wife Zhao, who was being held hostage, so that she could be taken to a safe place. Rescuing Zhao's wife was all part of the plan he had with Zhao. In short, he has now succeeded in killing the officers guarding the place one by one, so that under these conditions, he managed to meet Zhao's wife. There, he slowly invites his wife to immediately flee to find a safe place. He did that and he intended to check on Qian's condition. But unexpectedly, a sudden attack was immediately received. The bullet attack turned out to be the work of Bai Zan, the oldest figure who really wanted to erase Ye Feng. The chairman then said that at this time with his presence, it meant that Zhao had betrayed him. Bai Zan really doesn't accept this betrayal. Ye Feng, who heard that, then told Bai Zan that this was karma because previously this Bai Zan had taken Zhao's wife to take over. So with this evil act committed by Bai Zan, of course there is no reason for Zhao to continue to be faithful. At this condition Bai Zan would immediately kill Ye Feng, but soon Zhao immediately showed himself and said sorry if they had waited so long. With Zhao's appearance, this made the elder even more angry. Bai Zan then immediately took out his gun technique to directly attack Zhao. In this condition, Zhao told him to run away immediately and find a safe place while saving his wife while he was going to face this oldest figure. But Ye Feng was still there, so the fight now happened between Zhao and Bai Zan. Zhao, with his whirlwind technique, is now trying to destroy the various weapons issued by Bai Zan. Bai Zan's weapon initially succeeded in being conquered, but now Bai Zan immediately issued a huge bullet technique that directly attacked the direction of the wind, causing a huge explosion to occur. Such an explosion made Zhao lose the presence of Bai Zan's figure, and it turned out that Bai Zan immediately gave an attack from behind, which now unexpectedly made Zhao get a sharp stab right in the chest. Bai Zan was really satisfied with that. He felt that at this time it was no longer possible for Zhao to survive. When he was about to completely destroy Zhao, Suddenly Ye Feng attacked him very viciously. Ye Feng had now lost control of himself, and he was about to show how much demonic power he had. In the middle of the fight, it was unexpected Grandma also came with her men. There the men were ordered to immediately arrest Bazan because they needed Bazan alive to get various secret information. There Bazan also realized that there was an aura coming from the Grandma. Right now her condition was really threatened. She could no longer run away especially now that Ye Feng was really emotional, and immediately made an attack with such a great technique that even Bai Zan was sprawled and could only say how could Ye Feng have this much power. Ye Feng who heard that then immediately told Bai Zan that a person like Bai Zan who was a fly shouldn't ask that question. Ye Feng was really angry and was about to finish off Bai Zan immediately, but not long after, Grandma's men prevented this because she still needed Bai Zan alive. Grandma's men succeeded in sealing Bai Zan, so that Bai Zan could not escape anywhere. Ye Feng was really angry, and was about to finish off Bai Zan immediately. But not long after, Grandma's men prevented this because she still needed Bai Zan alive. Grandma's men succeeded in sealing Bai Zan so that Bai Zan could not escape anywhere. Ye Feng was really angry and was about to finish off Bai Zan immediately. But not long after, Grandma's men prevented this because she still needed Bai Zan alive. Grandma's men succeeded in sealing Bai Zan so that Bai Zan could not escape anywhere. In that condition, Ye Feng was forced to let it go because at this time Grandma also arrived there, and at least this was a form of respect, that right now all Ye Feng had to do was save Zhao. Then without thinking straight, go towards Zhao. There Zhao tried to ask Ye Feng about his wife's condition, but Ye Feng said that if his wife's condition was still fine, because currently being transferred to another dimension by Ye Feng. Zhao was very happy about it because it was the only soul he had. Meanwhile, Grandma and Ye Feng then became emotional with Bai Zan's actions. Grandma wants to know who is the real mastermind behind all this, and why Bai Zan could betray the organization and carry out his own plans. Bai Zan never answered as if he was afraid of something. Sure enough. Not long after, suddenly the lightning was striking so hard as if a great force would soon appear. The huge force that unexpectedly appeared immediately charged towards Bai Zan. Baizan was currently being killed by that figure so viciously that under these circumstances Baizan was unable to provide any information about the figure behind all of this. The attack was actually not experienced by the old man alone because Zhao was also attacked. But fortunately the attack was successfully broken by Ye Feng so that Zhao survived. With a situation like this, 
Everyone who was there was afraid. The grandma even now had to get escort from her men. Grandma didn't realize there would be an even more powerful being whose identity was not even known. This figure is really overpowered and doesn't want to show his identity. He was like a word as the ruler behind the clouds, but Zhao unexpectedly knew about a bit of information about this figure's prowess. Zhao said that the figure was really powerful and its existence was really very mysterious. In this condition, Grandma really didn't know what was going on. It was as if he had never known about secret information about a secret figure. But under these circumstances, he realized that this figure's goal was to kill the old man because he didn't want his secret to be exposed. Therefore, he first finished off the figure of the old man. Not long after that incident, Zhao finally opened his mouth. Zhao says that there is currently a fragment of Qian's soul in old man's body, so Ye Feng can take it and help Qian. In short, this Ye Feng managed to arrive at the hospital, and he managed to meet the grandfather. Grandfather immediately said that currently Qian's condition was getting weaker. Even so, Ye Feng also assured Grandfather that at this time, Qian would soon be able to recover. Ye Feng was about to use Qian's soul fragment. But first he tried to see the actual situation. After he did a vision, he found that there was a large figure who was now trying to keep an eye on everything that was happening. It was that figure that had been controlling Qian's soul all this time, and had kept Qian in this condition. That figure was truly formidable and powerful as hell, and couldn't even be touched. Within that vision, Ye Feng also felt himself present at that moment. But Ye Feng, who was a demon lord, could not move much when faced with a very difficult choice at that time. The mysterious figure manages to use Qian's soul to fight over a grand formation to destroy the planet. If the technique could be perfect later, it is very likely that Qian would also not survive and be destroyed along with the formation. At that time Ye Feng really wanted to save Qian, but it seemed as if he couldn't do that because this choice was very heavy. This vision that he felt made even Ye Feng completely in the dark with everything that was going on. He was quite worried about all of this to the point of breaking out into a bit of sweat. Then after that Ye Feng was planning to immediately leave this place when he managed to save Qian. But first he would soon know the identity of that secret figure who was famous for his strength. After that, Ye Feng also succeeded in recovering energy from Qian, and at this time he received a call from his friends where Ye Feng got the news that his friends had obtained a warehouse previously occupied by that secret figure. Looks like there will be an answer. Ye Feng who knew that rushed to head there. Ye Feng now managed to arrive there as well as Grandma and the others immediately opened a portal that contacted that place. After successfully doing it and opening it, suddenly something unexpected was inside, where in a large area inside it could be seen that there were many types of plants that seemed to have the potential to commit various crimes. On this basis, even the grandma without a second thought used her ability to immediately finish off these plants and destroy them. At times like that, it was seen that there was a high-ranking member of the Wang He organization who was currently spying on them. He would soon find out about all of this and report it to the higher-ups who were much higher than him. But before that, he would immediately attack Ye Feng as well as Grandma. He used a powerful destruction technique that caused a huge explosion to occur in that place. With that kind of explosion, the man realized that at this moment, Ye Feng and his Grandma had been wiped out by the attack earlier. But unexpectedly, Grandma and Ye Feng were still able to dodge and fly into the air with, Incidents like this also make them both aware that someone is watching them and has targeted them. Not long after, Grandma's subordinates came who immediately reported something there. They said that at this time they found a document whose contents were related to the Wang He of the Leaf Organization. It could be said to be the Myriad Leaf Union Organization. Knowing that name, Grandma was a little frightened because to deal with that organization would be quite difficult. Even so, Ye Feng wanted to do it anyway. Not long after, Ye Feng received a report about Qian's condition, who had now managed to regain consciousness and had opened her eyes. Ye Feng rushed to that place. Meanwhile, this matter would be Grandma's problem completely. Since he was not related to the business of this kind of organization, he immediately left the place. It wasn't long before Ye Feng even managed to arrive at the hospital at this time. There, he also saw Qian's conscious condition. Ye Feng asked if Qian remembered him. Qian then then said, if he still remembers Ye Feng's current figure. He was also happy to be able to meet Ye Feng again. Under these circumstances, 
Ye Feng promised Qian one thing, that he would never leave Qian again. But Chan's heart also told him where the possibility was that they would never meet again. Not long after, an unexpected situation occurred at the hospital, where a large explosion occurred at that place, causing many parties to suffer deep injuries in such conditions. It was then shown the figure of the spy who had previously targeted Ye Feng. The spy was very afraid of Ye Feng because, at this time, because he had to face Ye Feng one on one. With that encounter, it was finally Ye Feng who realized that this man was the leader of the Wang He organization or Myriad Leaf Union, and neither did he. Can do a lot. He tries to explain, if he doesn't know anything, he came here only for something. Hearing that, Ye Feng clearly couldn't believe it, because he was also sure that the man was part of the old man who was previously killed. Under these circumstances, Ye Feng tried to interrogate him by asking, who were the traitors in the Wang He organization? The man slowly tried to open his mouth. Ye Feng also told the man to confess what was actually being planned, but the man still couldn't reveal the secret completely. Here Ye Feng also realized that previously Bai Yi was deliberately invited to join the Wang He organization with the aim of spying on him. Ye Feng told the man to admit it, but the man then said, if he didn't know that, and actually Bai Yi also didn't know about everything at this point. But what is clear that he is doing all of this is an order from superiors who are much higher than him. He is doing this because he does not want to be finished in the organization. In this condition, Ye Feng was really angry and told the man to immediately open the card. Ye Feng then emphasized, who are the traitors here? The man also had no other choice but to say all that because he didn't want to die like this. Meanwhile, not long after in a different place, Fatty was seen who was currently directing several officers to carry out a plan. But unexpectedly, a man wearing a robe went straight to the place and immediately gave a great show. He killed one by one the officers in that place, and the man was really very emotional. Under such circumstances, Fatty was completely oblivious to who this mysterious man really was. During that incident, Ye Feng also got some of the names of the traitors said by the man. Ye Feng was still curious about some of the other traitors, but the man said, if he didn't know in such detail. But what is clear is that all the traitors are currently being controlled by a ruler who does have formidable power. Meanwhile, Fatty, who at this time saw that all the officers had been destroyed, only himself was left alone. In this condition, Fatty seemed to recognize this figure. He asked the mysterious figure, Why are you doing all this? And the man attacked him like he really didn't care what happened. In the 1980s, a cell light was on, and a person was hanging by a chain. His body was covered in bruises and blood from being tortured. Even his feet were tied so he couldn't escape. A fly then crawled on his face, but he still looked calm. Despite all this, food was the first word out of his mouth after all the interrogation and torture. The soldiers were shocked to hear what he had just said. One of the torturers said that South Korean soldiers could serve the spies with food, but they didn't do that. The man who was being tortured then said that he would tell everyone if they gave him food. The chief officer asked if he meant it. He says he will give him food, but he must tell him about his destination and infiltration route in return. The prisoner agreed and said he was just trying to make a living by joining the army, but this way he would starve to death. The chief officer ordered his subordinates to bring food from the kitchen, but his subordinates questioned his order, so the chief officer got angry and ordered him to shut up. He tells them that they have to hand this prisoner over to their superiors tomorrow, and that they will steal all their hard work if they can't get the information out of him. The subordinate finally understood and followed his orders. The prisoner was finally taken down and served food. He was given a spoon and chopsticks to eat his food, but his hands were still chained. He held the spoon with his fingers and started scooping up the soup. The prisoner then said that this soup tastes bland. Then he took one of the chopsticks and said that military food was always very strange. One of the army's underlings said that the taste of the food was not important right now. They were angry and intended to kill the prisoner. Suddenly the chopstick stabbed the chief officer's forehead. At first they did not understand what had happened, but then the officer's head fell on the table because he was dead. Now the soldiers were shocked to see this as they couldn't see anything that was happening. The prisoner then said that the taste of the food was important. He held chopsticks in his hand. All the soldiers ran towards him to kill him. 
but the prisoner was able to kill them all with a chopstick. He then told the dead men that he was a senior intelligence sergeant named Do Jiangon. His infiltration route was to swim through the ocean, and his goal was to kill them in the same way he had just done. Then he saw the fly that was bothering him before, so he aimed at it with his chopsticks and killed it. Do Jiangon also thought that he should stop doing this. After a while in the city of Seoul, Do Jiangon is sitting with Lieutenant Colonel Park in a small restaurant. Lieutenant Colonel Park tells him that there is no one like him in their company, so why does he want to quit? Du Jiangon replies that military food has lost its taste. Their food then arrived, and the delighted lieutenant smiled and added the chunks of meat to the bone soup. He then gave the rest to Du Jiangon, but Du Jiangon stops him with chopsticks and says he doesn't eat like that. Du Jiangon took the rice without scooping it all out at once. He then added it to the soup. This way, he could enjoy the meal to the end without the rice getting soggy. As he eats, Lieutenant Colonel Park asks if he will not quit because of the operation. Du Jiangon asks what he's asking because he just came back after finishing the surgery this time. Lieutenant Colonel Park said that he must have known exactly what operation he was referring to. Lieutenant Colonel Park said that at that time, the plan was to return alive, and when Du Jiangon returned alone, he did not fail in his operation. But Du Jiangon says, it's not about the operation. After a pause in their conversation, Do Jiangon thanked Lieutenant Colonel Park for taking in a person like him who had no home and helping him earn money. Lieutenant Colonel Park smiles and says, Du Jiangon did everything well, and he is sure Du Jiangon will be recognized for his abilities even after he is gone. One year later, at a construction site, two workers commented on Do Jiangon's work that he was very efficient at carrying heavy loads and digging. As Lieutenant Colonel Park said before, his abilities had been recognized, but he had not had an easy life. However, Do Jiangon tries his own way. Lunch break finally came, and Do Jiangon went to the nearest bank. Here he saw a girl at the counter busy dealing with older women. The girl looked at him, and Do Jiangon waved at her with a smile. During break time, Do Jiangon will go to the bank. It all started one year ago when he started working at a construction company. When he got his first paycheck, his owner advised him to save for the future because it would help him do what he wanted. But Do Jiangon doesn't know what he wants to do in the future, and there is nothing he wants to do with money. So, the next day... Do Jiangon went to a nearby bank during his lunch break and opened an account there. That day he saw the girl for the first time and fell in love with her at first sight. After that, Do Jiangon started going there every lunch break to see her, and every time he went there, he only saved 5,000 won, which was not a big amount. He wanted to go there as often as possible. After a year, the relationship that had built up between them was like the accumulation of interest in a bank book. Originally, Do Jiangon wanted the girl to recognize his face. Then they remember each other's names. He also found out that Seong Siona was born into a very harmonious family, but with low finances. So, as soon as she graduated from high school, she got a job at this bank and has been working until now. Do Jiangon tells Seong Siona that he was previously a soldier, and he worked at a construction site near a bank, living alone without a home or family to return to. Seong Siona asked, Do Jiangon wasn't he in the military for a long time and asked why Do Jiangon didn't have any money from it. Do Jiangon replied that he gave everything to the families of soldiers who died while serving in the same unit as him. Do Jiangon doesn't have a family, but they have parents, wife and children too. But for Do Jiangon it doesn't matter because he will work hard to save money again. Seong Siona seemed impressed to hear that. Back to the present as usual, Do Jiangon asked Seong Siona for help today. Xiong Siona received the book and advised Do Jiangon not to do this, and just save the money and then deposit it into a savings account with installments once a month. Because if not, this will be a hard job for Do Jiangon. Do Jiangon didn't know he had to do that, but he said if he did, he would only be able to see Xiong Xiongo once a month. Xiong Siona's face turned red and she returned Do Jiangon's savings book. Like that, Do Jiangon has a reason to live, but he still can't live well. He listened to the news on TV while lying on the couch at home tired. Do Yangon began to think about his past. When he became an adult, he entered the military and received various kinds of special training. He survived missions of high difficulty such as bombing, infiltration, and assassination. And Do Jiangon does his best at the job. However, in recent years he has felt that the things he is good at are not helping him make money, or he thinks that he might be bad at making money. He sighed and thought that he just wanted to eat good food. 
Shortly thereafter, he heard someone ringing the doorbell. The person who rang the bell asked if this was the residence of First Sergeant Do Jangan. Do Jangan partially opens the door and asks who he is. The person also asked if Do Jangan remembered him and introduced himself as Zhou Taemun. He said they had worked together before. Do Jangan also recognizes that he is Staff Sergeant Zhou. Staff Sergeant Zhou Taemun. The successor who was once involved in an operation with Do Jangan. He has sufficient qualifications as a soldier. But in the end, he was discharged from the military because of his temperamental nature. Do Jangon was surprised to see Zhou Taemun dressed well and wearing an expensive watch. Do Jangon then asked Zhou Taemun how he found him. Zhou Taemun replied that he heard Do Jangon had left the company and he looked everywhere for him and finally found him. He tells Do Jangon that he has a job request for him. Out of curiosity, Do Jangon asked what kind of job. Zhou Taemun also answered that it was the job that Do Jangon was best at. Du Jangon says he doesn't want to get his hands dirty for money. Zhou Taemun clarifies that he doesn't want him to kill anyone. He just wants Du Jangon to teach someone a lesson. Du Jangon gets serious and asks him to be honest about what he wants. Zhou Taemun said he was a successful businessman in the eyes of the public. But in reality, he is the boss of a gang, and the person Zhou Taemun wants Du Jangon to take care of is the boss of another gang. Du Jangon tells him that he didn't leave his army job to do something like that. Zhou Taemun, who was offended, asked what he meant by something like that. He asks if he quit his job to live in a rundown place like this. Du Jangon asks him to be careful with what he says. Zhou Taemun then said, If he agrees to do this job, he will pay him 50 million won. And with that money, he can buy a nice house or start a business to improve his life. Du Jangon thought he couldn't save that much even in 10 years while working at a construction job. Zhou Taemun gave him his card and said he could visit him if he changed his mind. Before Zhou Taemun left, he said that it was strange that someone like Du Jiangon tried to avoid doing something he was good at. Du Jiangon put his business card on the table and then lay down on the floor. He didn't think he came here to live like this, but he intended to try doing what he had been doing a little longer and find out if he really couldn't live without doing the thing he was good at. While thinking about this, Du Jiangon finally fell asleep. The next day at the construction site, many racks of cement bags were present there. When Do Jiangon arrived, his boss asked him to take all these bags to where they were needed. Do Jiangon then asked where the other workers were. His boss replied that he only called him because he saw him a few days ago carrying a load, and he thought he could do this job without any help. Do Jiangon looked at his smiling face and wondered if this man was really sane. Outside the bank, Seong Siona and her co-worker were standing outside the bank drinking tea. She looked up at the sky and wondered how she was going to get through the day. Her colleague asked her why she said that when her face was always bright during lunchtime. Seong Siona asked what she was talking about. Her colleague replied that she was really nice to Du Jangon, so she asked if she was attracted to him. Seong Siona replied that he only came to deposit money into his savings account. She said if this was a shop then Do Jiangon would be one of their regular customers, so she should treat him well. Her colleague says she might be right, but Do Jiangon doesn't look that handsome, nor is he rich. This comment made Xiong Siona uncomfortable. She smiled and said, Do Jiangon may not be handsome, but she has a nice body. Her colleague replied that he worked at a construction site and had to lift bricks and heavy loads all day. However, Xiong Siona said her father also used to work on construction sites, but never had a body like him. Seong Seong then leaned against her colleague and thanked her for meddling in her affairs. She warns her that she knows about her affair with the manager who looks down on them because they are from an all-girls technical high school. After returning to her counter, Seong Siona wondered why she was angry before when she talked about Do Jiangon. Then Do Jiangon suddenly entered the bank and waved at her. Seong Seona said it's not lunch break yet, so why is he here? Du Jiangon replied that he would be busy later and came a little earlier. Xiong Seona then asked if he was here to put money in his account, but Du Jiangon said that today he came to see Xiong Seona. While waving at her, Du Jiangon said he would deposit a lot of money in his account once he returned. Xiong Seona's cheeks turned red and thought that Du Jiangon had just come just to meet her here. She asked what was wrong with Du Jiangon because he was suddenly like this. Du Jiangon headed to the bus terminal and took a ticket to go to Daesan. He immediately contacted Zhou Taemun, accepted his offer, and headed to Daesan. While sitting on the bus, Do Jiangon saw Zhou Taemun's business card. 
He thought things might get better like what Joe Tamoon said. When he arrived, Joe Tamoon and his driver were already there to pick him up. When they had entered the car, Joe Tamoon showed an image of a target named Park Guanho. He tells him that the two of them are fighting for the rights to a tourist hotel slot machine. Joe Tamoon wanted to barge in and fight one-on-one -on -one and settle all of this himself, but he couldn't fight him head-on because this way he would lose the rights to the slot machine. But if an unknown outsider who had nothing to do with them suddenly appeared and did it, then Park Guanho probably wouldn't be able to show his face around here for a while and everything would run smoothly. Joe Taemun then warns that it won't be easy because Lieutenant Colonel Park knows he will come for him, so he is under safe guard. He suggested that he wait a moment until he lowered his guard. Do Jang-gon then asked him what time it was. Joe Taemun was confused and answered that it was half past one. Do Jang-gon also said that meant there was still a lot of time left until 4.30 in the afternoon. As Joe Taemun was still confused, Do Jang-gon informed the bank that it closed at 4.30 p.m. Now he asked him to take him to Park Guanho's place so he could take care of him quickly. So Joe Temun was able to deposit money in his bank account before the bank closed. Joe Temun said if he left now, he would have to fight many people, but Du Jangon thought it would be fine. After feeling stunned, Joe Temun finally agreed to Du Jangon's request. Joe Temun took him to the hotel where Park Guanho and his subordinates had lunch. He also warned him about the special guard who is always with Park Guanho. The man used to be a wrestler, so he advised Dojangon to be careful. Dojangon also asked what the best dish in this restaurant. The driver told him that here are good fried dumplings. Dojangon gets out of the car and says he'll be right back. The driver also asked Joe Taemun if he was sure that Dojangon was enough for this job. Joe Taemun replied that if another person like Dojangon appeared, the world would be in chaos. Inside the restaurant, Park Guanho was enjoying his lunch while all of his subordinates were there as well. Du Jiangon sits at a separate table in the corner with fried dumplings in front of him. He took the soy sauce and at a ratio of one to one poured it into the bowl. He then he sprinkled red pepper powder in it and dipped the dumplings in it. Du Jiangon then ate it and the taste of the food really satisfied him. Du Jiangon finished his food and drank his drink. Du Jiangon, who felt very satisfied, thanked him for this delicious food. After that, he started throwing glasses at Park Guanho and smashed them against the wall behind him. The fat man got angry and asked what was wrong with him. Du Yangon says he's trying to start a fight because the sound of his boss chewing food is annoying. Park Guanho looked at him in annoyance and ordered his men to arrest him. They all ran towards him to attack him. In the face of the gang members running towards him, Du Yangon smiled. After a while, food was scattered, furniture was broken, and beaten men were everywhere on the floor. Only Du Jiangon is standing with his hands in his pockets. The battered Park Guanho asked who he was, because there was no way he didn't know a man as strong as him in this field. Du Jiangon replied that he could remember him as an outsider with severe anger management issues. Park Guanho grinned with his nose bleeding and asked who sent it. He said he would pay him double if he worked with him. Du Jiangon wasn't sure if that person had enough money to pay him 100 million won. While Park Guanho was talking something, Dojangon asked him why he stopped talking. Suddenly he realized that there was someone behind him. The fat man was holding a chair in his hand and ready to attack him. Dojangon defended himself using his arms. When the fat man attacked, he felt excruciating pain. Like something inside his body had broken. He was about to hit him again, but Dojangon kicked him in the groin. Tears quickly streamed down his face. Due to the pain, he fell to the ground and became unconscious. Do Jangon then raised his leg and kicked the fat man hard. Do Jangon then looked at Park Guanho and asked if 4.30 in the afternoon was past. A nervous Park Guanho checked his watch and said it wasn't even 2 p.m. yet. Do Jangon said it was good and left. When Do Jangon walked away, Park Guanho asked while shouting what was so good. Do Jangon and Joe Temun came out of the bank after depositing money in Do Jangon's account. Joe Taemun said he didn't think he would make it before when the bank closed. Joe Taemun then asked what he would do with this money. Do Jangon answered that he wasn't sure, but he saw some apartments near the bus terminal this morning, and maybe he would buy one there. Joe Taemun also said that the neighborhood was not very good, so he advised Do Jangon to look for an apartment somewhere in the middle of Seoul. Do Jangon thinks he might try stocks since everyone is doing that nowadays? Joe Taemun asked if he had a shop in mind. He suggested that he buy Han Electronics as there was no chance for the company to go bankrupt as it was responsible for supplying electricity throughout the country. 
Do Jungan said Sam Electronics seemed fine to him, because the company's new chairman was a smart man. Suddenly, he felt pain as if he had just been electrocuted. Do Jungan then asked if they could go to the hospital because he was sick where he got hit. Joe Tamun said they could go to the hospital he visited regularly. Do Jungan asked what he means regularly. He replies that there is an old doctor who doesn't seem surprised when he shows up there after being stabbed or injured. When he gets there, Du Jungon's arms are plastered and he wonders what happened to him. The doctor told him that his arm was fractured and that the fracture would take a month to heal. A shocked Do Jungon asks if he should stay like this for a month. Doctors warned him not to use his arm as it would delay the healing process. Do Jungon didn't like the situation where he was trapped in a stupid situation. Joe Temun mocked him and said someone would have a hard time from now on. After leaving the hospital, the two of them went to a bar and drank. Do Jangun felt good, but then he asked if he could drink in this state. Joe Temun asked if he didn't remember how he taught them to drink to heal wounds. Do Jangun laughs and says it's been a while since he heard that line. They both continue to drink and remember their past in the army when they worked together. Zhou Taemun said he always knew that Do Jangan was strong, but he didn't know he would defeat so many people in such a short amount of time. Moreover, he won the fight with his bare hands. He said he also had guns ready in case he needed them. Do Jangan asks how he got the gun. While pouring more drinks, Zhou Taemun informed him that rifles were easily available, but he had smuggled a revolver from Russia. Do Jangan said Zhou Taemun had found a suitable job for him. Zhou Taemun replied that the army suits him better. He also says Special Forces is also a good fit for Dujangon and asks why he left the job. Dujangon becomes morose and says he and his three juniors participated in the mission, but he was the only one who came back alive. Jote Moon was surprised. Dujangon said he felt he no longer had the right to continue this work, so he quit. He thought they would come in his dreams, but they never did. He thought maybe they really hated him. Jote Moon also asked him to drink again. After a while, they both looked at all the empty bottles and realized that they had drunk a lot. Do Jangon stood up and said he was leaving. Jo Tamun asked how he was going to get home now. Do Jangon said he would take the bus because he wanted to sleep on the bed. Jo Tamun thought he could book him a room at the hotel and he could leave tomorrow, but Do Jangon rejected it. Do Jangon was currently leaving while walking on the sidewalk. He felt like he had eaten too much, so he sat down on the bench but he drank too much so he fell asleep on the park bench. It wasn't long before a van from the homeless guidance center passed him and stopped. Seeing Do Jangan lying on the bench, several workers saw this drunk man with both hands paralyzed lying there. They decided to take him in and give him some guidance, so they took him with them to the welfare facility. Do Jangan wakes up and sees a dream. He was in a field and it was very dark. Everywhere someone calls his name. He turned sharply when the voice came from behind. He saw two men in uniform. Both wore the same dog tag. Dojangon recognized them. They were his junior partners on the mission. Suddenly he saw a gun by his feet. Dojangon takes it and holds it to his head, saying if this is what they want, he will do it. But suddenly, he wakes up from his dream. He saw a man clap his hands in front of his face to wake him up. Dojangon sits up, but his arm still hurts. He asks the man who he is and where he is now. The man told him that his name was Lee Sunjo and this place was a welfare facility. He told me it was a convict's clothes and wanted to explain more. But while he was explaining all that, Dojangon stood up and left. Lee Sunjo asked him where he was going. Dojangon replied that he was going home. He then stopped near the door because it was locked. He wondered why the door was locked from the inside. Lee Sunjo said he would explain that this was a place where people were forcibly imprisoned. Du Jangon is surprised and asks what he is talking about. But someone calls them from behind and asks what are they doing standing there. Li Sunjo told Du Jangon that that person was their platoon leader and had a bad temper. Therefore he warned Du Jangon not to disturb him. But Du Jangon saw the key pinned to his arm and asked him to give him the key to the door. The man looked at him so angrily that Du Jangon kicked his leg and he screamed in pain. He wanted to punch him in the face but then remembered what the doctor had told him about not being able to use his arms, so he stopped. Two of the leader's subordinates asked for permission to destroy Do Jangon. The man also ordered them to just send him to prison. One of them moved forward to hit him. Do Jangon thought he could defeat them even with his injured arm, but if Lee Sunjo was right and they were imprisoned there by force, 
It would be difficult to escape with an injured arm. In order to escape from here, his arm needed to be properly healed. But the wound would likely worsen if the arm was hit, even if by accident. So he thought about what he should do. At the same time, Lee Sunjo came forward and told them that this man just came last night and didn't know where he was, and he didn't know who the great platoon leader was. Because of that, he behaved arrogantly. The man thought that it made sense. Lee Sunjo said they should give him one chance and he would educate him properly. The man thought, and Lee Sunjo whispered to Du Jangon to beg for mercy, and said that it was all his fault. Du Jangon is still in shock processing what happened here, but he lowers his head and apologizes. But the man punched him in the head and told him to behave better. Then he asked everyone to go and prepare for the call. While marching, Lee Sunjo told him that he did well and he would explain things later. Du Jangon observes that the man is counting people. There were 24 people including the new guy and he started unlocking the door. On their way out, Du Jangon asked Lee Sunjo where they were going and he replied that they would have breakfast. After listening to Du Jangon's breakfast, he became happy. He looked around and thought that this wasn't even a military base. But they all looked alike. Besides, this wasn't even a prison, but detaining people. But the strangest thing for Do Jangon was that they called trash in front of him breakfast. He wanted to stab the person in charge of the food with his chopsticks on the forehead, but they only gave them cutlery. While eating food, Lee Sunjo told him this place was a place where homeless people were brought in and guided. Do Jangon said he was not homeless, but Lee Sunjo said everyone in prison said the same thing. This place is actually where there are people who are captured and forced to work. The state funds every homeless person here, and to get that money, welfare facilities lock people up. Du Jangon is surprised to hear that, and asks who did this, and what kind of human could do that. Suddenly two men entered the room. Lee Sunjo told him that these were people who did this to humans. Both of them are the director's sons. The one with the glasses is Park Guang, the vice president here. The taller one is Park Yom, and he is the general manager. Du Jangon looks at them and says that they look like the president is on an inspection. Lee Sunjo said now was Do Jangon's chance to please those powerful people. There, Park Guang approached Do Jangon and asked him how he got this wound on his arm. Lee Sunjo told him that Do Jangon was a new convict who came here last night. Park Guang asked if it was possible for him to live comfortably like this. Lee Sunjo said he would take good care of him and would teach him everything. Park Guang also appreciated his efforts. Lee Sunjo said he wanted to be the model student he got. Park Guang smiled and said he would remember his name the next time he chose. Now Du Jangon also discovered Lee Sunjo's real motive for being so kind to him. Park Guang asked Du Jangon if the food here tastes good. He replied that the food is very bad here. Park Guang, who looked irritated, asked what he just said. Lee Sunjo also started to worry because he was fine in front of the platoon leader, but now he was acting up again. Du Jangon says he doesn't think this food is even for humans because it's all so rotten. Park Guang lifted his tray of food and poured it on Do Jangon's head. He said he should thank them for giving him this food. He then smashes the tray on his head and asks how he dares complain about anything. He then threw the tray at Do Jangon's head. Blood rushed into their Do Jangon's eyes in anger, but he did nothing because of his broken arm. Park Guang shouted at Lee Sunjo to teach him so he wouldn't say such crazy things anymore. After they left, Lee Sunjo asked if he was okay. But Du Jangon looks very angry because of it. Du Jangon dusted himself off after the insult. He was upset because he couldn't even clean himself properly due to his fractured arm. Afterwards, Du Jangon and Lee Sunjo swept the ground outside because this was the job assigned to them. Du Jangon complained because his clothes still weren't dry. But Lee Sunjo said the clothes were automatic when he worked. He then says he should be relieved that Park Wong did this to him before bath time. Otherwise, he would have had to wait to clean himself. Do Jangon replied that it was unethical to do this to people before or after bathing. Then all of a sudden, the inmate's bald old man comes there with clothes to wash and agrees with Do Jangon. Do Jangon noticed that his way of speaking was a bit strange. Lee Sunjo called him His Highness and asked why he was here. Do Jangon wonders if he means the president when he calls him His Majesty. A man then calls him from behind and says His Highness is said to be washing rags, so what is he doing out there? His Highness rushes away asking why he is always the one doing the laundry. Du Jangun asks why the man is referred to as a noble and why he talks like he is the president. Lee Sunjo said it was not because he was impersonating the president, but he thought he was the president. 
He told me that he was an old man who came back from the Vietnam War and went crazy. He saw something and had a nightmare. He dreaded the sight of the bald president and shut him up every time he saw him on the news. As he aged, he became bald, and he couldn't look in the mirror because it reminded him of the bald president's presence. Du Jangun says it's a shame he has to suffer. He asked Lee Sunjo how he knew so much about him, and he answered that the old man's friend was also locked up here, and he told him everything, but died due to some disease. Du Jangun is shocked and asks if he died in this place. Lee Sunjo said many people died here. Some were injured, some were sick, or some were beaten by staff or platoon leaders. He then asked if Do Jangan remembered the platoon leader saying he would send him to prison. He said if someone was sent to prison they would not care for him there. They would leave him until he died. Do Jangan said that these people were very evil. Suddenly the platoon leader called everyone to gather on the sports field. Lee Sunjo told him that today was investigation day and he could see the worst person among all the bad guys. Du Jungon wonders what he's talking about. All of the detainees stood to listen to the director of the welfare facility. His name is Park Inje. Everyone bowed before him and he started talking and said there are various trees in the world, each of which has its uses. Similarly, humans also have their uses according to their prospective character and potential. Yet those who stood before him were worthless beings who were completely worthless on the outside. He called them crooked, unattractive trees. Then he said that just like Jesus, he became a carpenter to prune useless trees like them so they could find their worth. Everyone started clapping. Dujangun didn't like all the nonsense he said shamelessly. While pretending to listen, he paid attention to the structure of the welfare facility. This place was created by cutting the middle of the mountain. Most of this place is surrounded by high walls. The only place without walls was the cliff where the mountain was cut. There was only one main gate but the guards would attack him simultaneously if he tried to escape through the gate, so it was difficult to escape this hand. The speech finally ended, and Park Inje walked down the stage. He hugs his sons and thanks them for taking care of this place. Then Park Guang came on stage and announced the names of the inmates who were selected as model students. Lee Sunjo was excited and hoped he could be selected as a model student. Do Jangan asks him what an honor student is, he replied that it was the person selected to be sent home from the welfare facility. Park Guang said that the person chosen this time was from Platoon 4. Park Guang called Kwok Du Yong to the stage. Kwok Du Yong thanks him and says he is happy that he can finally come home. Lee Sunjo felt envious seeing that. Kwok Du Yong was then taken to the staff office where he asked when he would be discharged. Park Guang told him that the doctor would come to check on his health one last time before he was sent home. After a while, the doctor came there to do a general examination and declared that he was healthy. Then he gave him an injection saying it was the nutrition that would keep him healthy on the outside. Soon, Kwok Du Yong was unconscious. Two people then started taking him outside. When they brought him, Park Guang asked them to take off his clothes because newcomers could use them to save money. The doctor said that Park Guang was amazing and asked how he could even think about saving in this situation. Park Yom replies that he is no nonsense like he who risked all his money and is now working under him. He warned the doctor not to cross the line if he wanted to save himself. Time had passed and Kwok Du Yong was lying unconscious in the operating room. The doctor asked his assistant what today's order was about. He said it was liver and kidney. His assistant then asked if it was okay not to give this person anesthetic gas because he could wake up at any moment. But the doctor took it as an insult and asked his assistant to do as he asked. Meanwhile, Kwok Du Yong wakes up and sits wondering where he is. The doctor told him that they were checking him, therefore he didn't need to be afraid. He also punched the doctor in the face and ran away from there. Kwok Du Yong didn't understand why he was here, even though they said he could go home. At the turn, he saw Park Yom walking. Park Yom looks very intimidating in front of Kwok Du Yong. Park Yom then punched Kwok Du Yong in the face. Kwok Du Yong was then dragged back to the operating room by Park Yom. After they entered, the door closed. Joe Taemun and his subordinates sat down at a restaurant to eat. His subordinates informed Joe Taemun that Park Guanho and his men were hospitalized, so their organization was paralyzed for now. As a result, Congressman Choi's office grants them the right to operate the slot machine business. Immediately, Joe Taemun put down his bowl and laughed loudly, saying he would drink drink until he was drunk. His subordinates told him that Congressman Choi somehow already knew everything that happened in one day, and he said he would give them the business right away. 
Joe Taemoon said Choi was a smart old man and had quick decision-making, which made him a member of parliament. His subordinates then said that Choi wanted them to cut the ribbon to celebrate the opening of the slot machine. Joe Taemoon has no problem with this. While eating fried dumplings, Joe Taemoon recalled the time when Dujangon asked about this restaurant's food. The driver said that the fried dumplings here are really good. Dujangon came out and said that he would be back soon. Joe Taemoon agrees that these fried dumplings are really delicious, but he was worried whether Dujangon would get home safely because his arm was injured. Meanwhile, Dujangon closes the spray bottle at the welfare facility. Lee Sunjo said that Dojangon hadn't told him his name, so he asked his name. Dujangon replied that his name was Dojangon. Then Lee Sunjo asked him about the work he used to do outside. Dujangon starts to think and replies that he usually does work that uses physical strength. Lee Sunjo asked if he injured his arm at work. Dujangon then thought of when the fat man hit him with a chair and said yes. It wasn't long before the platoon leader came over and asked if they needed to talk a lot during their work. Lee Sunjo became frightened and apologized to him. The platoon leader asked Dujangon what he did in front of the vice president to make him angry. Before he could answer, the platoon leader asked him to forget the question and be more careful next time, then asked if he understood. Dujangon just kept silent. The platoon leader then hit him on the head and asked him to answer. Dujangon gritted his teeth and answered yes. He looked at the key hanging from his arm and asked Lee Sunjo why the door was locked from the inside. They should have locked it from the outside if they wanted to lock it. Lee Sunjo answered that a long time ago someone came for an inspection and said it was troublesome to lock from the outside because it looked like a prison. Since that day, they closed the door from inside. He adds that they choose people to be platoon leaders who have no outside authority. So they're obsessed with their newfound power and don't take them prisoners. Dujangon finally understood the whole situation now. Lee Sunjo said he felt jealous because the man would be home now. But he was trapped here. Elsewhere, the doctor hands over a box of organs to General Manager Park Yom. The doctor asks Park Yom to tell the vice president that he completed everything without incident. Park Yom looked at him and then kicked him in the stomach. He told him to call the vice president, sir. He then told him that he should accept his mistake and reflect on it. Park Yom then throws an envelope of money in front of him and leaves. The doctor forgot all the pain and guilt when he saw the money and started thinking about today's winnings and gambling. General Manager Park Yom then went to the smugglers and gave them the organ box. They then paid him a large sum. Park Yom then went back to his father's place and gave him all the money. His father praises his good work and asks him to rest as delivering the box must be difficult. Then he put the money in a safe full of cash and locked it after that. Time passed and everyone was sleeping there, but he suddenly woke up. Dujangon thought that he had been there for four days and was used to this life. The experience of intensive training while active in the army really helped him adapt to this environment. But the one thing that still amused him was the food here. But he had no other choice until his arm healed. So he made himself believe that he was on a covert operation to survive here. He thought that, back then, he was afraid of nothing even life-threatening missions. But now he was worried about one thing. He couldn't see Xiong Xiong Ah during lunch break. He was worried what if Xiong Xiong forgot about him. Meanwhile, on the other side, Xiong Xiong Ah was also waiting for him and looked at the door expecting Do Jiang Gon. But when the door opened, it wasn't Do Jiang Gon who appeared. Her colleague then advised her to take a lunch break and she would stand guard. While standing outside the bank, Xiong Xiong Ah questions why Do Jiang Gon hasn't appeared for several days. Xiong Siona remembers when Do Jiangon left, he said he would come back with money. Xiong Siona hopes that Do Jiangon is fine and that nothing bad happens to him. Xiong Siona hopes that Do Jiangon is not injured, but on Do Jiangon's side, his hand is injured. Xiong Siona wondered if Do Jiangon had had an accident. At that time, the platoon leader slapped Do Jiangon because he was working too slowly. To protect him, His Highness tells him that he will go the extra mile to compensate for this and asks not to hit him as he is injured. The platoon leader then grabbed his noble by the collar and shouted at him to stop talking nonsense and calling him a madman. His Highness replied that he had not lost his mind and was the president of the country. The platoon leader then punched him in the face and walked away. Du Jiangon, who saw His Majesty crying in pain, started to get angry and stood up. In his anger, he called the platoon leader to stop and called him a dog. After hearing Dojangon summon the dog platoon leader, everyone in the room was terrified. 
The platoon leader turned his head angrily and asked if he had gone mad. Dojangon remained calm and did not answer him. The platoon leader's two underlings looked at him angrily. Dujangon saw them and thought that before the two people got in the way, he would kill them as fast as he could. The platoon leader ran towards him to attack him, but Dojangon jumped in the air and kicked him. The kick was so hard that the platoon leader fell to the ground and became unconscious. They both then ran towards him to hit Dojangon. Dojangon thought it was difficult to handle three people at the same time when both his arms were injured, but these two were different and he could beat them easily. He looked at one of them and grinned to make him lose his cool and it worked. The man attacked him repeatedly, but Dojangon dodged every time, then finds the right moment and kicks his back knee. The man grimaced in pain. Then Dojangon throws up and kicks his chin, then knocks him down. He then threw one kick at the last man and knocked out all his opponents there. People were shocked to see one person beating three people. After doing that, Dojangon realized that he was losing his temper. He might get in trouble if employees come there and see all this mess. Suddenly, Lee Sunjo started cheering his name, and all the other prisoners followed suit. He tries to cover it up, but they ignore him. Dujangon gets worried. If any welfare workers come now, things will become even more complicated for him. Not long after, what he was worried about happened. A worker comes inside and asks what all the noise is about. Suddenly, every prisoner closed their mouths. When the man saw the platoon leader who fell to the ground, he took out his baton and pointed it at Dojangon and asked if he was the one who did this. Dojangon didn't say anything, and he thought he could get rid of him if he kicked him throwing away his stick, then headbutted him in the face, and then kicked him in the stomach. He asked himself whether he should subdue this person and get out of here, but in the end, he will be blocked by a high wall of steel gates, and they will try to stop him with full force. In that situation, it would be difficult for him to protect his arm. He could knock down some of them without using his arms, but if he got a more severe arm injury, he wouldn't be able to escape. So the best course of action to take now is to apologize. So he bends down in front of him and says he did all that by mistake. At the same time, both brothers come there. Park Guang asked if he was the one who caused this mess. Dujangon realizes that things can't get any more complicated than they are now. Park Guang said it was amazing that a single man with an injured arm defeated three people by himself. He says he thought Dujangon was just a fool who couldn't stand up for himself and could only complain about food. But it turns out he's much more than that. Then Park Guang asked what Dujangon's name was and what he was thinking while doing this. But Park Guang said that he doesn't care what Dujangon thinks. He was angry about the fact that Dujangon thought, and it was a big problem. Dujangon gets confused with Park Guang. Park Guang told him the rule was that platoon members must always listen to their leader. He had made those rules and others had to follow them no matter what. Park Yom glares at his face and says he can still see that Dojangon is still thinking. Park Guang then said that Dojangon would be in the punishment room for three days. Even Lee Sunjo was surprised to hear this sentence. Dojangon thinks it sounds like a prison cell, and three days in a cell is not a big deal. Park Guang laughed hysterically and said that when he returned from that room, he would have no thoughts. However, Park Guang told him to reflect on himself in these three days during his sentence. He waited for an answer, but Dojangon didn't speak and kept looking into his eyes. Park Wong turned around and looked at his brother for a sign. Park Yom walks up to him and calls his name, but Dojangon doesn't answer, so he punches him in the face until his nose breaks and it starts bleeding. Then he told him to answer Park Wong. Dojangon said yes twice. Then the man kicked him in the stomach and told Dojangon to hit back just once. Park Yom pushes Dojangon's limits, but he has to stay calm. So he answered again and said yes. Park Yom hits him again, telling him to answer loudly and clearly. Park Guang thought before sending Dojangon to the punishment room, he wanted to set an example for others so that they would not rebel against him. Then employees took him outside to lock him in the punishment room. Lee Sunjo was worried about what would happen to him in the punishment room. Dojangon then looked back and smiled at Lee Sunjo. Lee Sunjo thought he must have gotten too smacked on the head a few times after seeing him smile. While walking towards the punishment room, Dojangon thinks about the punch and says General Manager Park Yom's fist is quite strong. But he smiled, thinking that his boxing was better, and he wanted to fight with him once his arm was completely healed. The welfare facility employee then hit him on the head and asked him to hurry up. He replies that he will come and thinks he will also hit this guy. Park Yom slaps the unconscious platoon leader in the face. After being hit, he finally opened his eyes. Annoyed, he shouted who did it, but he saw Park Yom in front of him and closed his mouth automatically. 
Park Yeom tells him to come with him and tells the other workers to go back to work because their break time is over. They then took him outside. Park Gwang told him that he didn't think he was fit to be a platoon leader anymore. He replied that it was not and that he could become the leader. Park Gwang then asks him how he can say that after being beaten and crushed by a man who can't even use his arms. He takes his badge and asks how can he lead if weak. But the platoon leader thought that he was not weak. But Dojanggon was much stronger and had nimble feet. But he couldn't tell Park Gwang because he would be transferred as platoon leader after that. So he lied and said that he was attacked from behind. Because of that, he couldn't protect himself. Park Gwang then asked if he wanted to say he could beat him in a real fight. Park Gwang orders him to go and beat him now. The platoon leader was frightened and asked if he should fight him. Park Gwang asks him how he can lead a platoon after being knocked out in front of his people. He tells him that he has sent Do Jang-gon to the punishment cell for three days. In fact, he was shocked to hear about Do Jang-gon getting a three-day sentence there. Park Gwang said that the fight between them would happen after he came out of the punishment room and after Do Jang-gon lost his mind. Now the platoon leader understood why Do Jang-gon was sent there on purpose. He will be mentally and physically weak after coming out, and he can beat him easily. Park Gwang patted him on the shoulder and asked if he could do this. Finally, the platoon leader said yes. Do Jang-gun was taken to the basement by officers. There was a big cell created there and they entered it. Do Jang-gun saw some small rooms and thought he would be taken to solitary confinement, but he wondered why they made isolation rooms in the basement. Then he was surprised when the man opened the room and asked him to come in. The reason was that it wasn't a room, but rather a locker that a person could barely fit inside. Do Jang-gun wonders if they are punishing innocent people by locking them in here. The officer then shouted at him to move quickly and pointed his cane at Do Jang-gon's arm, then told him to get in before his arm was broken. Do Jang-gon finally gets inside and barely fits in there. He couldn't even stand up straight. The door was finally closed and the entire cell was dark and empty. Do Jang-gon thought that when he was in military training, he was trained in all forms of torture that might occur when captured by the enemy. Indoor torture is one of them. It is a torture where one cannot sit or lie down so one cannot sleep properly in an uncomfortable position. They can't even eat, drink, or even pee. The person is forced to remain in this position. According to him, this kind of torture is used to break the enemy physically and mentally. But Do jang was furious that they could use this kind of torture on normal people. However, what was more worrying now was that he would have to spend three days here. The sixth day begins when the sun illuminates the sky and spreads beauty outward. One day has passed since Do jang was locked up in that punishment cell but he can't keep track of the time and all other happenings outside. He wondered if it had been a day. He was exhausted, but he continued to fall asleep and woke up in a standing position. He wasn't sure if he was asleep or just opened his eyes briefly, but on top of all this, he felt very hungry. He wanted to eat and his tongue kept saying one word, food. On the other side in the third platoon hall, Lee Sunjo was beaten by the platoon leader. Everyone present there was terrified seeing him like this. Lee Sunjo cried in pain because he wasn't used to it. The platoon leader shouted at him and said that he knew Lee Sunjo sided with Do Jang-gon while he was unconscious. He asks how he is happy now to be beaten for siding with him. Lee Sunjo tried to say something, but the platoon leader kicked his leg and covered his mouth. He tried to make other people feel ashamed because they were all involved in the rebellion scheme. Now everyone is hiding their faces like they know nothing about it. The platoon leader then grabbed Lee Sunjo by the hair and said he would show him what happens to people who go against their leader. Then he hit him in the face with his knee and threw him to the floor. He kept hitting him with his feet. His majesty comes to him and asks him to stop this brutality, and asks why he is taking it out on him. The platoon leader saw him and then kicked him so he fell on top of Lee Sunjo. Elsewhere, Park Wang and Park Yom are waiting for their father to pack the money in a shoebox in the director's office. He puts the money in a bag and says this is a bribe for a government employee. He prepared three bags and said the amount of money was the same, so they just had to deliver it. Park Gwang also asked Park Yom to come with him this time and he agreed. Park Gwang then saw a large box of money kept separately on the floor and asked, What about that one? His father told him to leave this one here because it was for someone else. Park Yom asks why there is so much money in this box, and his father tells him that the people who receive this box are more than government employees. He is a very important key to the management of this country. Park Gwang and Park Yom also drove the car to deliver the money. On his way, Park Yom asks about how these people can help them in their business and get this gift in return. Park Gwang replied that they helped in various ways. 
they arrived at the welfare department of Daesan City Hall. The employees said he was grateful. This helps them to get government funding. Park Guang replied that he felt obligated to do more for themselves. In the seaside town, they meet the head of the Daesan police station. After looking at the shoebox, the man said these shoes look good and heavy. Park Guang bowed his head in respect and said that he should travel around the country for the citizens. So he asked him to keep doing what he was doing and running around in the shoes they gave him. And finally, they gave him to the Dayson district prosecutor on an empty street and gave him his gift. They suppress any attempts by whistleblowers to expose welfare facilities to the public. The prosecutor held the bag in a way that seemed to guess its weight. He speaks in code and says that he likes apples, but pears will do this time. Park Guang bowed his head and assured him that he would bring apples once the season came. After the prosecutor leaves, Park Guang mutters that he doesn't need to be picky about it and takes what they give him. He then gave some money to Park Yom. Park Yom is shocked and asks if he took some of the bribe money. Park Guang answered yes and asked how they could bribe someone if they didn't get anything for the trouble they had. He tells him that he also took some bribes last time and no one found them. That's why he brought Park Yom here. He says his brothers should share good things. Park Yom thanks him for looking after him. After sitting in the car, Park Guang asked him to go to eat something good, because they had done a good job. After arriving at the restaurant, they ordered some meat cooked by themselves. Park Guang put a piece of meat and some seasonings on a lettuce leaf and fed Park Yom with his hands. Seeing his younger brother chewing food, Park Guanho said that he ate very well. They also enjoyed their meal. In the middle, Park Yom asks if Park Guang is serious about forcing the leader of Squad 3 and Du Jiangon to fight once he comes out. But Park Guang believes a man who has been in the punishment room for three days has no chance of winning. Park Yom replies that he knows there is no chance of winning for normal people in this situation. But Do Jiangon knocks out three men with broken arms. Park Yom said he thinks this might happen. Park Guang interrupts him and asks Park Yom if he thinks Do Jiangon will be of use to them if he is really strong. Park Yom asked how Park Guang got him to listen to him when he could beat up a platoon leader and his men. Park Guang said it was almost impossible for now, but if he destroyed him this time because of the punishment room, he could make him follow his every order. Two days finally passed since Do Jiangon was locked up in the punishment room. Do Jiangon couldn't sleep for two days in a row. His face looked like a soldier who had lost his country. He was very hungry, and his mouth was saying the words of all the food he could think of right now. He gave his mind and body a reason to keep on living and not give up. Besides, back then, he thought of another reason to keep fighting. It was Miss Xiong Siona. Her beautiful face and sweet smile appeared in his mind. Do Jiangon remembered that he had never asked her out to eat. He imagined the scene in his mind when he asked Xiong Siona to have dinner with him, and Xiong Siona would happily accept his invitation. And when Xiong Siona asks what they should eat, he will answer that it doesn't matter as long as he eats with her. He said these words while trying hard to keep himself alive. The third day of punishment had finally ended in this punishment room. The next day when the lockers were opened, Do Jiangon fell to the ground because he didn't have the strength to control his body. He could barely lift his neck and look up. Park Guang looked at him and smirked while saying that these were the eyes he wanted to see. Park Guang ordered them to quickly move Do Jiangon from here. Do Jiangon lay on the floor and couldn't move because of the lack of energy. Li Sunjo and his highness, who were standing near their bars, came there and helped Do Jiangon up by supporting him. Li Sunjo looked at him and said he didn't look good and they should move him fast. They helped Do Jiangon walk and they all followed Park Guang. While passing through an empty lot, Do Jiangon saw Li Sunjo's face and asked him if he was okay and what happened to his face. Li Sunjo told him that he was beaten by the platoon leader for siding with him that day, and they also beat His Majesty for raising his voice for Li Sunjo. His Majesty smiles and says he is fine. When Do Jiangon looks at him, he feels sorry for him. He asked Li Sunjo where they were going because he was starving and wanted to eat something. Li Sunjo replied that they were not going to eat at this time. All the prisoners gathered in the field and looked fearfully at the platoon leader. The platoon leader looks ready to fight. Du Jiangon was also brought here, but he looked miserable as he was barely standing. He understood that they were trying to make him fight the platoon leader as soon as he came out of the punishment room. The platoon leader remembered what Park Guang had told him that day. He had to save some face after getting beat up in front of everyone. He thought that he had already won this fight. All he has to do is defeat Do Jiangon while acting as if nothing is wrong. 
Park Wong laughed and said it was like watching a gladiator duel, but Park Yom didn't laugh at his joke. He looks at Do Jangon and says that this is more like an execution than a duel, but Park Guang says it will still be fun to watch. He then ordered his officers to start the fight. Both of them were brought in front of each other. The referee tells them to start when he gives them the signal. The weak Do Jangon thought that he wanted to rest for a while. The platoon leader looked at his friends as they tried to say something. The referee finally gave the signal to start the fight. The platoon leader shouted like he was trying to intimidate Do Jangon. At that moment he remembered yesterday's meeting with his friends. He tells them he will fight Do Jangon once he gets out. He was still worried because they all knew how strong Do Jangon was and how he beat them all with his feet. He said that Do Jangon would not be in the best condition after his discharge, but he still wanted to ensure his victory in the fight. His friend told him that there is one way. He said that Do Jangon's arm was injured, so he had to kick his arm when the fight started. He was sure it would hurt him like hell and he wouldn't be able to fight back. The platoon leader also said it was a cheap trick, but that was what could give him victory. When the fight started, the platoon leader ran towards him while shouting at full power. Meanwhile, Do Jangon moves from his place and thinks this will end if he gets beaten, so he wanted to let him beat him up and finish it quickly, because he had no desire to fight. But suddenly he remembered his injured arm, and he couldn't just let him beat him like that. When the platoon leader threw a kick towards his arm, he bent backwards to avoid it. The platoon leader didn't expect it, and was shocked. Do Jangon turned to attack and threw a kick at the platoon leader's stomach. The platoon leader screamed in pain and his face turned red. Park Yom was surprised to see his moves and wondered if he practiced martial arts. Park Guang laughed in amusement. Tears and saliva flowed from the platoon leader's eyes and mouth. He thought if Do Jangun had just come out of the punishment room. But how could he be so strong? Do Jangun then saw Lee Sunjo's injured face and his majesty, who was beaten for cheering for him that day. This increased Do Jangun's anger and the desire for revenge emerged in his mind. He turned to the platoon leader. The platoon leader could see what would happen to him next. Do Jangon kicked him in the face and broke his nose so it bled. This one strike sent him crashing to the ground. Everyone's eyes forgot to blink because everyone there was so shocked. Do Jangon then continued to beat him with kicks to his face. The platoon leader's friends were frightened by what was happening there. Lee Sunjo got excited and once again started cheering for Do Jangon. His Majesty is also happy, and says he has always believed in him. The platoon leader seemed to be half dead when foam came out of his mouth. Do Jangon then approached Park Guang and asked him if he was satisfied now. Park Guang smiled and replied that he was a funny guy, and yes, he was completely satisfied. Do Jangon said he would go, but before he finished his sentence, Do Jangon lost consciousness and fell to the ground. The referee ran over to him to check if he was okay. Park Guang asked about what happened to him. Referee sees his face and says he's sleeping. Park Guang smirked and said this guy was really funny, and he had thought of a good and fun idea for him. Du Jangon was sleeping soundly, but suddenly he opened his eyes. He saw Lee Sunjo standing beside him, excited to see him wake up. Du Jangon looked weak and couldn't open his eyes properly. He asked in a weak voice what happened. Lee Sunjo replied while yawning that he fell asleep, and Lee Sunjo brought him here. He also skipped work today to be here with her. Du Jangon tried to sit up but suddenly he saw a ribbon and key stuck to his arm and asked Lee Sunjo what this was. Lee Sunjo told him that the vice president crowned him as the new leader of the third platoon while he was asleep. Do Jangun looks at him and asks if he's serious. Park Wang and Park Yom are in the office. Park Yom looks a little worried about something. Park Guang made tea and added two spoonfuls of tea sugar and milk each. He then gave his teacup to Park Yom and asked him to be careful because it was hot. While sipping his tea, Park Yom asked him what he was thinking at that time. Park Guang said what he meant. He said he didn't like the taste of the tea because it tasted good to him. Park Yom replies that he's not talking about that, but he does ask why he made Du Jangon the platoon leader. Park Guang replied that the first and most important reason was that the previous leader was weaker than he expected, and Du Jangon was stronger than he thought, so he would come in handy when they needed him. Park Yom said that he thinks Do Jangon is not just an ordinary person who knows how to fight. He also thinks about his fighting style and says Do Jangon is definitely a trained fighter. Park Guang asked him what he wanted to say here. Park Yom replies that if Do Jangon's arm heals completely, they might not be able to control it anymore. Park Guang then asked if he knew about this. 
he says only hire one of their workers to lead the platoon. He told Park Yom to imagine if 30 prisoners attacked one employee at the same time, it would not take much effort to defeat one worker. If they think about it according to the physical aspect, it makes sense. But not a single prisoner came out in rebellion and attacked that one employee. Park Guang asked why they hesitated to do it. Park Yom answered that there are two possibilities. The first reason, they hate each other, or they think that other employees can quickly provide help. Even if they tried, they knew they would most likely only get as far as the barricades and walls, and then they would be beaten and put in the punishment room. Park Guang answered that that wasn't the exact reason why they didn't rebel, but because fear and helplessness control them and keep them obedient. In Southeast Asia, when they train elephants, they tie up baby elephants and beat them with iron hooks to make them afraid of humans. Even when the elephant grows big and can trample a person to death, it cannot do so because it is afraid of humans. Du Jungon was like that baby elephant. They had to train him the same way they would train anyone else. Park Yom asked if it was really necessary to make Du Jungon a platoon leader. Park Guang says it is necessary because this position will relax him, and as time passes, he will accept this place as his home like the others. At that time, Du Jungon was sitting on his bed. Meanwhile, the two subordinates of the previous platoon leader sat down on the floor nearby. They asked Do Jangon to forgive them for what they did to him in the past. Do Jangon is informed that the former platoon leader was sent to prison after the fight, and now his followers are begging for their lives on their knees. He told them that they apologized to him, but he could not forgive them. Their faces turned gloomy and they asked why. Do Jangon tells them that he cannot forgive them because he has nothing to forgive. He had not been there long and held no grudge against either of them. They also look relieved, but then Dojangan says they are the ones who should be apologized for. Dojangan then yawned and told them to talk it over among themselves since he was going to sleep again. The two of them kept screaming for help to save them, but Dojangan turned his head away and fell asleep. After Dojangan wakes up, he wonders if lying down like that ever made him this happy. Then he saw the keys and the armband and wondered why they were giving him these things. He remembered that they were just about to make an example of him when he walked out of the punishment room. They hoped to save some face for the platoon leader from his final defeat, but then their plans were ruined by him. When he took the guy down, they might send him to jail because he was no longer of any use after losing to him twice to him. Du Jonggon could understand their plan up to this point, but what could be the reason for making him the platoon leader? Du Jonggon started grinning and saying how adorable they were. According to Du Jangon, they have never met anyone smarter than them because of the rotten environment around them, or they don't know that other people are not as selfish as they are. Du Jangon decided that he would do what they wanted for now, because this was the best way. At the Daesan Hotel, there is a celebration of the opening day of the casino and dining room. All the decorations were made according to Joe Taemun, and Choi was ready to cut the ribbon. The speaker announces the ribbon-cutting ceremony will begin, and begins the countdown. When the count was up, they finally cut the ribbon and the media took their photos. Then Choi shook hands with Joe Taemun, congratulating him on this big day. Joe Taemun respectfully bowed his shoulders and expressed his thanks to Senator Choi, but in his mind, he called him an old bastard and said if he hadn't had a tug of war between him and Park Guanho, he wouldn't have had to wait this long. The Senator's secretary then reminded him that it was time for his next appointment. So he goes and says they will meet soon and discuss what they couldn't do today. Joe Taemun bowed his head and congratulated him on his journey. After they leave, his secretary tells him that the senator has left and he can stand up straight now. Joe Taemun was annoyed because he knew the senator would call to see him again, and that meant his secretary would have to prepare another box of apples for him. Then Joe Taemun invited everyone to go eat. One of his underlings asked where they should go eat. Joe Tamun replied that they would go to a place where the dumplings were delicious, but they could order whatever they wanted. While the treats were going on, Joe Tamun looked happy today, so he enjoyed it with them as well. His secretary poured him a drink. He said that Joe Tamun had done a good job, but he suddenly became moody while drinking, so his secretary asked him what was the reason for this sudden sadness. He says if this is because of the money to give to the senator, he doesn't need to worry as he can make a lot of money with this new business. Joe Taemun said money is nice, but everything is boring. He said that when he first started it, he liked it because everything had a clear set of rules. The strongest person will get to the top. Just like that, he got rid of the weak and made it here. But now that he had the business, 
he had to hold himself up front like a senator. Joe Tamoon said that business rules are dirty. After dinner, Joe Tamoon said goodbye to his men who bowed before him. On the way home, he asked the driver to drop him off there. His subordinate warned that they were still a little far from home, and he was also drunk. Joe Tamoon assured him that he just wanted to take a walk. He will come to his senses after a walk. On his way, suddenly he was called by Park Guanho and his men in front of him. Joe Tamoon smiled and asked where the others were. Were they still in the hospital? Park Guanho looked at him angrily and said he came here because he had to ask him a few questions. Joe Tamoon said that he knew the rules. If they won against him, he would answer his questions. Park Guanho was annoyed and ordered his men to attack Joe Tamoon. Joe Tamoon got excited and started running towards them. When Joe Tamoon ran towards them, he was greeted by a big man who was waving his wooden staff. But Joe Tamoon could easily avoid it. As if playing games, he said that almost in a mocking tone. Another member of Park Guanho's gang then swung his wooden stick at Joe Tamoon while calling Joe Tamoon an arrogant, impudent person. But Joe Tamoon once again dodged it and responded with a punch to the face very quickly. Joe Tamoon replied that he was not arrogant, but he was just confident in his abilities. The counterattack was so fast that the gang members were almost unconscious and fell down. At that moment, Joe Tamoon punched another enemy. Joe Tamoon asked in a mocking tone where their self-confidence had gone. At that time, the man attacked Joe Tamoon from behind, but Joe Tamoon noticed and punched him. He then turned back and asked where he had been because he was interrupted in the middle of the conversation. Suddenly, someone strangled him. The big man who was previously fought by Dojangon strangled Joe Tamoon and lifted him in the air, saying that he could continue talking nonsense. While strangling Joe Tamoon, he told Joe Tamoon to continue spouting nonsense because his next words might be his last words. Joe Taemun was in pain and had difficulty breathing when he lifted her. Park Guanho's subordinates were happy to see him, but the big man suddenly screamed in pain. The big man was shaking in pain while holding his crotch because he had been kicked hard in the groin. Joe Taemun, who had been put down, punched the big man in response. After that, Joe Taemun took a wooden stick and said that the warm-up was finished, but suddenly they were stopped by Park Guanho. He said that this was enough and invited Joe Taemun to talk. Joe Taemun threw away his wooden stick and agreed to Park Guanho's invitation. Joe Taemun then asked why Park Guanho was here and whether he wanted to arrest him for stealing the founding rights of a slot machine company. Park Guanho replied no because revenge would not earn him that right. As he said earlier, Joe Taemun wanted to ask Joe Taemun something. He asked the person who attacked them alone. Park Guanho told him not to even think about being evasive by saying he wasn't the one because there was no reason to hide it anymore since he already got the business. Joe Tamoon replied that it was true and asked what was the reason he was looking for him to get revenge. Joe Tamoon walked back and said that he would not say anything that Park Guanho did because he already said he would answer if he won. Park Guanho then asked where Du Jungun was now because he couldn't find him anywhere. Joe Tamoon answered that he didn't know either but he told him that Do Jangon left after drinking with him the night he attacked Park Guanho. Joe Tamoon even emphasized that he really didn't know where Do Jangon had gone. After leaving that place, Joe Tamoon felt uncomfortable because he was drenched in sweat, but he found it a relief. Park Guanho and his subordinates returned to their headquarters. The big man apologized to Park Guanho, but Park Guanho said that he didn't expect much from the start. He knew that even if the man's body was in the best condition, he didn't stand a chance. Suddenly a loud voice called Park Guanho. Someone arrived at the door and asked what was going on here. He is Sang Chil, who just came back from reservist training. Park Guanho also told what happened to Sang Chil. Hearing that Sang Chil said that this was not what he thought would happen when he went to practice and apologized to Park Guanho. But Park Guanho said that it wasn't his fault that he joined the reservist training, but Kim Shinjo's. Sang Chiol then said that he would kill Joe Taemun now, but he was stopped by Park Guanho and told him to forget it because he had to do other things. He then asked Sang Chiol if he had heard about the hospital where Joe Taemun's subordinate was being treated. Sang Chiol knows that place which is led by the old man. Park Guanho told that the person who attacked them injured his arm, so he might be hospitalized there. He tells Sang Chiol to go find information about him. Sang Chiol doesn't understand why Park Guanho is targeting Do Jangon. Even though he was paid by Joe Taemun and the one stealing their business was Joe Taemun, he asked whether they should target Joe Taemun. Park Wanho replied that Do Jangon had stepped on his pride. 
For gangsters, that's outrageous. Sang Chiu finally understood and agreed to Park Guan Ho's order. The next day, the old doctor who had treated Do Jang Gun asked where he was injured. Sang Chiu, who was in front of him, answered that it was in his heart because someone was causing trouble with his young Nim. He then suddenly grabbed the old doctor by the head and slammed his head on the table. After being asked, the old doctor finally told him that the name of the man he was treating at that time was Do Jang Gun. Sang Chiu then asked for the insurance number and address, but the old doctor didn't know because he didn't ask for data like that from the patient Zhou Tim Moon brought. After getting information from the old doctor, Sang Chiu called Park Guan Ho and told him that he only got his name from the old doctor. Hearing that, Park Guan Ho told Sang Chiu to visit another place. He told them that the children found the bar where Du Zhang Gon and Zhou Tae Moon were drinking together. Sang Chiu also visited the place and ordered a bottle of soju and udon. After receiving the food he ordered, Sang Chiu asked if he had ever seen anyone with casts on both hands here. When the restaurant owner answered yes, Sang Chiu gave him the money and asked him to tell him about it. He accepted the money and said that Do Jang Gon was drunk after drinking several bottles of soju and said he had to go home. He remembered that Do Jang Gon said he could go up and he didn't think his house was around here. Soon someone called Sang Chiu loudly. Not far from his table, it turned out that Zhou Tamun's subordinates were eating there. They asked Sang Chiu what he's doing here. Sang Chiu realized that they were members of Zhou Tamun's gang and told the shop owner to hide first. When approached by members of Zhou Tamun's gang, Sang Chiu replied that he wanted to eat udon because he said it was delicious and asked what was wrong with that. One of Zhou Tamun's gang members looks at him aggressively and asks if he knows this around their area. Sang Chiu looked back and said that he didn't enter his territory and ordered udon. Gang member Zhou Tamun smiled and said to Sang Chiu that his gang was a mess when he left and asked if he didn't hear. Suddenly, he was flushed by hot udon. Sang Chiu stood up holding the soju bottle. He then swung the bottle and hit him on the head. After that, Sang Chiu asked the other Zhou Tamun gang members if they wanted to. The remaining members of Zhou Tamun's gang hesitate in front of Sang Chiu. Sang Chiu then suddenly kicked one of Zhou Tamun's gang members in the head. The last member of Zhou Tamun's gang was scared to see him, but he decided to punch Sang Chiu. But he was met with a fist from Sang Chiu. They finally left the restaurant. Sang Chiu asked the shop owner to continue their conversation earlier. The shop owner told him that Do Jung Gon might have gone out drunk and said he wanted to take the bus, even though there were no buses. So he said that Do Jang Gon might be sleeping on the street because he couldn't get the bus. Sang Chiu thought that made sense and that he might just get a bus in the morning. He gets annoyed because this is more complicated because Do Jang Gon has been gone for a long time. But the shop owner said it was possible that Do Jang Gon was still in this city. When asked why he was so sure, the shop owner said that recently, the Daesan Welfare Facility had been rounding up homeless people and people sleeping on the streets at night, and from what he's heard, you could get arrested just for walking alone at night. Hearing that, Sang Chul decided to check it out then, at the welfare facility, currently on lunch break. At that time, Do Jang Gon seemed to be thinking about something. Lee Sun Jo, who realized this, asked Do Jang Gon if he thought of something. Do Jang Gon replied that he was wondering if he could recover if he ate trash like this. His Highness also offers to find herbal medicine for him. Do Jang Gon didn't expect that they had herbal medicine here. Lee Sunjo also said that if he could, he would be very grateful. But Lee Sunjo whispered to Do Jang Gon because they knew how he was. Do Jang Gon also remembered with a noble state hearing that. Not long after, Park Guang and Park Yom came to this place and were greeted by the prisoners. Park Guang then noticed Do Jang Gon's existence and came over to him. Do Jang Gon also greeted Park Guang. Park Guang then said, however, Do Jang Gon had been here for quite a while so he asked how the food was. Hearing that question, Do Jang Gon was silent for a moment. Lee Sun Jo hoped in his heart that Do Jang Gon would not say extravagant things like before. Do Jang Gon answered that the food tasted very good. Park Wang was satisfied with that answer and left Do Jang Gon. Once they left Lee Sun Jo, that was good work. When Park Wang went out with his sister, he said that as they saw, humans adapt as their environment changes. However, Park Yom wasn't so sure and glanced at Do Jang Gon who was chatting with his friends. Park Guang is very confident that he can master Do Jang Gon in the near future. On a wall, His Highness is looking for something in a hole in the wall. Lee Sun Jo, who witnessed this, asked why he even dug a hole in the wall, even though he said he wanted to find herbal medicine. 
His Highness asked him to be patient first. Li Sunjo then asked why Du Jiangan was also coming. Du Jiangan answered Li Sunjo himself who ordered him to obey. Besides, there was nothing he could do for the rest of lunchtime. While still in the military, Du Jiangan and his friends also spent time with unimportant activities, and he believes the time they spend doing that is a moment where they can feel like ordinary people. He thought moments like that were really needed in a place like this, the Dacen Welfare Facility. His Majesty finally found what he was looking for. He then gave what he found to Do Jiangan. Li Sunjo was surprised because what His Majesty was was a baby mouse. His Majesty said that these mice were born from sick mothers, but they were still young, so they were fine to eat. The meat and bones are soft, so he can eat everything. Do Jiangan was hesitant when he heard that he had to eat everything, but His Majesty asked, didn't Du Jiangon need calcium and protein to heal his hands? Li Sunjo felt this was too much and asked Du Jiangon to leave. Du Jiangon wonders in his mind whether His Highness studied this in Vietnam or at the Samchung re-education camp. He also might know from the street when his mind is not in his right mind. Li Sunjo found it strange that Du Jiangon was silent. Du Jiangon then said that he was right. At first, Li Sunjo thought that Du Jiangon said he was right. But Du Jiangan said that if his hand wants to heal, he needs nutrition, which surprised Li Sunjo. Du Jiangan then took the baby rats from his highness and immediately ate them. Li Sunjo, who witnessed that, felt like throwing up. While eating the baby rats, Du Jiangan thinks that in order to survive here, he must always remember that he is just an ordinary person. However, in order to survive in this cruel place, he had to be even more ruthless. In the staff room, one of the employees was getting ready to change his clothes. When his friend saw that, he said that he was jealous because he wanted to go home now while he was on duty today. They then asked why he was in such a hurry, even though he was not married, and did not have a wife waiting for him at home. Another friend of his said that precisely because he didn't have a wife waiting at home, he was excited to go home. The employee ignored them and said he would go ahead. He bit his nails and thought that he didn't have a wife he wanted to meet, but he had someone else he really wanted to meet. While holding the cards, he was very hopeful. He was gambling in a restaurant. When he saw the cards he got, he thought he would finally win. On the table there are so many piles of money. He thought that he had already borrowed money from the dealer, and it was too late when he realized it, but he thought that it would be fine since he would win. When he heard the results of the other player's cards, he thought that this was good, and showed his cards confidently because he got a nine. But another player who had not yet shown his cards, asked in a mocking tone whether he was sure that he was lucky with the bad cards. He was annoyed by the taunt, but the player then showed that he had a flush. He was shocked and asked how this could happen. Having lost all the money he had lent him, he was approached by security and invited to hold a private counseling session on how to repay them. Moments later, he was naked and beaten. He didn't understand how it could be like this and why his opponent was able to get a flush. Then suddenly, he heard a loud sound that startled him. Sang Chiu comes and says that he shouldn't think about why he got the royal flush, but should introspect on why he gambled. He then asks who he is, but Sang Chiu replies that he doesn't need to know who he is and asks if he works at the Daesan Welfare Facility. He was surprised and asked how Sang Chiu could know. Sang Chiu didn't answer that and said that he wanted to ask a few things because he needed confirmation about whether the person he was looking for was there or not. At first he refused because the internal information was confidential. Sang Chil knew that. That's why he came here to ask him. He was hesitant, but Sang Chil said that he took over his debt from the townhouse manager, so he owed Sang Chil now. However, Sang Chil said that if he did as he was told, he would erase the debt. So once again Sang Chil asked if there was anyone named Do Jiangon at the Daesan Welfare Facility. He told me that both of his hands were injured, so it should be easy to find. He also remembered Do Jiangan who fought against the platoon leader before, and told Sang Chiu that he was there. Sang Chiu then asked if he could bring Do Jiangan to him, because he had to take care of some things with him. Sang Chiu really wants to meet Do Jiangan to kill him. But the welfare facility employee replied that it was impossible because it was completely beyond his control, especially when it comes to sneaking prisoners out of the facility. After thinking for a moment, he asked him if he could go inside. The welfare facility employee also said that Sang Chiol didn't seem to know what kind of place a welfare facility was. He said that the place was worse than the prison out there. And once in, it's nearly impossible to get out. Sang Chiol also said that meant he had to help him. However, 
The welfare facility employee answered that it was difficult to do because the security was very high. But there was one way. He informed that the facility regularly patrolled at night according to schedule. That's when they arrested homeless people, drunks and others on the streets of Daesan. If Sang Chiol pretended to be homeless on the date he said, then he could enter the facility without being suspected. Sang Chiol also agreed to the plan. On the announced date, the welfare facility employee asked Sang Chiol if he really wanted to write off his debt. After that, he gave Sang Chiol his prison clothes and asked him to change his clothes. After wearing the shirt, Sang Chiol said that he would write a letter of recommendation regarding the payment of the employee's debt. He is then taken to the third platoon, where Du Jianggon is, and he tells them to welcome the newcomers. Li Sunjo wondered how the newcomer ended up here. Du Jianggon came over to Sang Chiol and said that he hoped they could get along well, then introduced his name. Seeing Du Jianggon greet him, he was sure that he was Du Jianggon because both of his hands were in casts. Sang Chiu lowered his head and introduced himself to Do Jiangan and asked Do Jiangan not to speak formally to him. Do Jiangan was surprised by Sang Chiu's reaction. Sang Chiu then said that he didn't know what to do because he was dragged to this place suddenly, but smiled and said that he knew that in the land of Joseon he had to respect those who were more powerful than him. Do Jiangan laughed awkwardly and asked Li Sunjo to take Sang Chiu to an empty bed. Li Sunjo cheerfully asked Sang Chiu to follow him while bringing Sang Chiu. Li Sunjo said that from what he saw, he felt that Sang Chiu could blend in well. Sang Chiu replied that he had experience with this kind of environment. Li Sunjo also said, no matter what, just continue with that attitude. But suddenly, Sang Chiu called him harshly. With an intimidating look, Sang Chiu asked Li Sunjo if he had the platoon commander's armband. Li Sunjo became nervous and answered no. Sang Chiu also asked why Li Sunjo told him to do this and that. The frightened Li Sunjo apologized and showed Sang Chiu's bed. Sang Chiu lay down on the bed and closed his eyes. The armband on Do Jiangon's arm, Li Sunjo felt very jealous. Noticing Li Sunjo's face, Do Jiangon laughed and asked if he was crying. Li Sunjo turned his face away and reasoned that he was yawning because he was sleepy. At that time, Sang Chiu thought that he could not believe that Do Jiangon was kidnapped and placed in a situation like this. But Do Jiangon had an armband and was made a platoon leader in this place. However, he thought that it was better for him. He'll pretend to follow this damn role and kill Do Jiangan when he's off guard.